like to welcome everyone to the Church of Christ located in Ludington, Michigan. We appreciate everyone's attendance, everyone's um, interest in this topic and in this subject. It's not very often that we get to see debate. It used to be very commonplace, and the most commonplace I can think of finding debates is in your Bibles. Jesus debated every day of his life, and so did his apostles and the ministers that went out to spread the gospel to all the world. And using them as our example and using them as uh, a way to do things and get things done to come to agreement, that's what this is all about. We're not here uh, just trying to pick a fight with people because uh, we just want to fight. We're here to get to the bottom of the truth, to understand it, to live it, to love it, to learn it, to take it out and share it with others. That's what this is all about, being real, honest people to the best of our ability. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to read to you some rules of the debate tonight, and then I'm going to introduce my brother, Hoger Neubauer, is going to have the first affirmative, and I'm going to explain what that's about also. So let me read you the rules of Hedge's Rules of Honorable Controversy. Rule number one, the terms in which question and debate is expressed and the precise point at issue should be so clearly defined that there should be no misunderstanding respecting them. If this is not done, the dispute is liable to be in a great degree verbal. Arguments will be misapplied and the controversy uh, protracted because the parties engaged in it have different apprehensions of the question. Rule number two, the parties should mutually consider each other as standing on a footing of equality in respect to the subject in debate. Each should regard the other as possessing equal talent, knowledge, desire for truth with himself, and that is, uh, and that it is possible, therefore, that he may be in the wrong and his adversary in the right. Rule number three, all expressions which are unmeaning or without effect in regard to the subject in debate should be strictly avoided. Rule number four, personal reflections on any adversary should be in no wise, uh, shall in no instance be indulged. Rule number five, no one has a right to accuse his adversary of indirect motive. Rule number six, the consequences of any doctrine are not to be charged on him who maintains it unless he expressly avows them. Rule number seven, as truth and not victory is the professed object of controversy, whatsoever proves may be advanced on either side should be examined with fairness and candor. And any attempt to ensnare an adversary by the arts of sophistry, sophistry or to lessen the force of his reasoning by wit, cavilling, or ridicule is a violation of the rules of honorable controversy. Those are the rules of the debate, and I'm going to explain that Brother Hoger Neubauer has the affirmative. It is his job. What that means is he will be putting forth an argument affirming his belief. It is Brother Lockwood's uh, position to answer his questions and to follow him. He is in the negative. He's not to make an affirmative argument. He's to follow the arguments of the affirmative in this debate. So I want to make that clear. Also, if you have phones, please turn them down or turn them off. Also, we do not want any audible noises, no amening, no clapping, no whistling, no kind of audible noises coming from the audience. Please refrain from such. Let the debaters do their debating uh, without any outside interference, please. If you're watching on YouTube, you can submit your questions, uh, but we are going to limit the questions uh, tonight to five questions. If not, it becomes, uh, we could be here all night, especially with the YouTube audience, <laughs> but uh, we're going to limit questions to, to five and so if you're here at the end of these uh, exchanges, the first five people with their hands up will probably be the winners. <laughs> I don't know how else to do it. Um, I reckon that's all I got at this time for um, the rules of the debate. And so now I consider a great privilege and a great honor to introduce to you one of the finest men I've ever met in my life. Holger Neubauer is the preacher at the Lakeshore Church of Christ in South Haven, Michigan. I met Hoger about, and boy, it's getting, it's, we're getting long in the tooth now, Hoger. It's been about 15, 16 years ago, uh, maybe longer. I think it's been longer than that. But um, my family and I were searching for a church to go to that we could, we could consider faithful. And we found Hoger's uh, congregation down in South Haven. And we drove 130 miles 
over three and a half years faithfully to attend service with Holger. I've never met a more faithful man. He doesn't just talk the talk. This man walks the walk. And just to give you a quick glimpse of his personality, on the second or third time I got to meet Holger, I knew he was a very, what I consider, conservative Christian. I appreciated that so much with so few of them left. And I went up to Holger and I said, Brother Holger, I want you to know I'm a very conservative Christian also. And Holger looked at me and said, well, I'm not trying to be conservative. I only want to be faithful. And I said, you mean, to, I, you wouldn't want to be liberal. And he looked at me and he said, aren't you liberal? And I said, absolutely not. He said, you're not liberal in your love? You're not liberal in your giving? He said, there's a balance to keep. We need to be liberal in some places. We need to be conservative. He said, the idea is not liberal or conservative. The idea is faithful. We want to be faithful. That's what Brother Hogan Neubauer is. Brother, God bless you. Appreciate him. I've learned a lot from him. And let me give you at this time, Brother Hogan Neubauer. First, before we actually begin in the reading of the proposition, I want to just take a few moments, don't I agree, to just make some introductory remarks. And I want to thank Bill Lockwood for coming to Ludington all the way from Iowa Park, Texas. And we'd like to officially welcome him now to God's country. And uh, we think we have a beautiful part of uh, the United States of America. We think that West Michigan is just gorgeous, and we're glad that you have come. And I want to thank you, Bill, for being reasonable, being kind. You're easy to work with. As a matter of fact, if we didn't disagree so strongly about this issue, we may become best of buddies. And uh, Bill has been kind and reasonable. Thank you so much for coming to Todd, your wife, and uh, I can't remember the name. It's LL. I remember that, though. So uh, you've traveled all the way from Texas. Thank you for coming. I appreciate that. I want to thank the congregation here at Ludington for your faithfulness, for your wonderful dedication, and for promoting the truth. You are responsible for putting forward the printing and the mailing of Spirit and Life magazine, which is doing wonderful work and changing minds. And so we're so thankful for that. And I want to thank my good friend, Brother Steve Bazin, being the spearhead of this great work. You know, the Bible says of Paul that I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Steve Bazin planted, Steve Bazin watered, God gave the increase. There was no church here 13, 14 years ago, no congregation. And he planted the congregation, his resolve was to preach the truth, to stand for the truth, and I admired him. I admire him, and he is one of the best friends that I've ever had in my life, and I can't imagine my life without Steve Bazin. So thank you, Steve, for so much. I want to say just a little bit before I read the proposition about the nature of debating. Debating can prove very, very useful if the individuals in the debate respect one another and simply debate the proposition. Now, they can get nasty. And uh, we didn't have a nasty debate in Iowa Park. I don't think we're going to have one here in Ludington. What we want to do is challenge the speaker and his ideas to see if they fit with the scripture. And so we're going to go back and forward. We're going to press each other. We're going to press each other in a hard way, but we're going to respect each other at the same time. Now, the Hebrews believed what was called the pill pool. Now, the pill pool was through academic debate that the stronger ideas would win and the weaker ideas would be defeated. Now, Bill and I have a debate. We had a debate in Iowa Park. This is the second leg of the debate. Brethren used to debate four nights. So this is a two-night debate. We had a two-night debate. We're going to have a third debate we've agreed to in Daleville, Alabama, October 11th and 12th. And so we believe through a series of debates, we will be able to see the strengths and the weaknesses of each uh, position as it's presented before you. And the Hebrews believed if you had a debate for the cause of heaven, a machliket yeshim shamiin, that it would stand. 
And with all of my heart, I want to have a debate for the cause of heaven. I'm not here to wrangle. I'm here because I've had a change of mind. I have. I've had a change of mind. And I'm here to be able to defend what I believe. So let's now have the proposition. It's just my responsibility as the affirmative speaker to define it, to read it, and to explain it. So, resolve. Do I have my... Oh, here we go. Resolve. The scriptures teach that the second and final coming of Christ took place in the fall of Jerusalem. Now, it's very significant that I define my proposition because you need to understand the consequence and the details of what I'm arguing. When I say scriptures, I mean the entirety of the Bible. And when I say the entirety of the Bible, I believe that the prophets had one great end of the age in mind and that the New Testament is simply the revealing of the Old Testament, that there is such an integral relationship between the two Testaments that when Jesus came to fulfill the Old Covenant world and the New Testament writers were fulfilling them, that that Old Testament was not fulfilled into the fall of Jerusalem. There is one great end. I affirm the Scriptures teach one great end. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, the Bible says the end of all things was at hand. When Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 14, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature for a witness, and then the end will come, he was answering the question of the end of the age. And so there's one great end. And when Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24, then comes the end, he's not going to make up another end. My opponent will have more ends than old McDonald's. Here an end, there an end, everywhere an end end. I suggest to you there is one great end, and the scriptures teach, that the second and the final coming of Christ took place in the fall of Jerusalem. If I can demonstrate to you that the Old Testament contains the promises and the prophecies that Jerusalem would fall and salvation would be granted, my proposition stands, and I have proven what the Scriptures teach. And so today we begin with Acts 13, verse 27. This is significant, so I invite Bill to pay close attention. Paul is now in the Antioch, a synagogue, Antioch of Pisidia. And he's arguing the case why Jesus was mistaken, uh, was not uh, recognized when he came, and why they, did, they mistook him and they didn't uh, see him as their Messiah. So Paul quotes to the, uh, speaks to those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, the most august, the most learned, the great Sanhedrin, the distinguished men, missed the coming of Christ. They missed their own Messiah. Why did Paul say they missed their Messiah? Because they did not know him, nor the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled in condemning him. They missed the voices of the prophets. Now, they were read every Sabbath day. They had missed the spiritual significance of the mission of Christ. You see, they wanted a physical ruler. They wanted one who would rule over their enemies. And Rome was ruling, but Jesus didn't come as a military leader. He would say, the kingdom is God within you. My opponent, Brother Bill, is guilty of the same error. He has missed the second coming of Christ because he doesn't know the voices of the prophets. And I'm going to prove in just a little bit he doesn't know the voices of the prophets. When Paul argued, he argued from the law of Moses and the prophets. So in house arrest... In Rome, notice what the Bible says, Acts 28, 23. So when they had appointed him a day, and he came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained solemnly and testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them from concerning, uh, concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning till evening. The kingdom of God is understood from the law and the prophets. Jesus doesn't have another kingdom in mind. He's establishing that kingdom. It's simply a proleptical, uh, proleptical approach, proleptical approach to the New Testament. Let's go up, Scott. Acts 26, 22, and 23. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no of the things that those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and he would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. The Jews missed their Messiah because they were looking for a physical king and a physical kingdom, and Brother Bill Lockwood and every futurist missed the second coming of Christ, because they make the same error. 
Bill believes that Jesus will return one day and put down Vladimir Putin, Kim Jong-un, probably the Democratic caucus, along with Vladimir Putin, right? No, he misunderstands the nature of what Jesus was doing. He was coming to open heaven. There's a principle called the principle of parsimony, that God does what he needs to do in order to procure his purposes. And the purpose is to open heaven. And when Jerusalem fell, my position is that heaven was open, and I will prove that before this debate is over. Now, I know that Bill is not familiar with the voices of the prophets. Bill had a publication called Hammer and Tongs about 20 years ago. Those of us in conservative ranks, we read it with much interest. I agreed with much of what he had to say. But I thought it interesting that he has this label, this name, hammer and tongs. Now, in our first debate, Bill accused me of having eureka moments. You remember that? I said, eureka moments, and now I've come to a different conclusion. You should have had a eureka moment with hammer and tongs. So I'm reading about a month ago through Isaiah chapter 44. And in verse 9, we find there is an image made, and the image is made by a blacksmith. And the blacksmith is now wielding his hammer and his tongs. And so now Bill Lockwood has a term where you find hammer and tongs, which has an idolatrous background. I suggest to you if he used this term in the first century, the Jews would have taken him with hammer and tongs outside of the city and thrown him off the brow of the hill. Now, I know he's, what he's going to say is, well, there's a hammer in Jeremiah chapter 23, and there's tongs in the temple service, right? But when you find hammer and tongs together, Bill, that's an idolatrous background. I charge you for not knowing the voice of the prophet. You know, I had a eureka moment. I said, Bill, has Bill ever said this? I suspect that he has very little pushback. You know why? Because we're not trained in the law and the prophets. When we first had, uh, where am I going here? Okay. When we first had some exchange, remember I gave you Zechariah 14, and you said, appreciate your knowledge of the Old Testament. You didn't want to get into that right now. I wanted to stu study them. The truth of the matter is I know that he doesn't know the voice of the prophets. If he knew the voice of the prophets, he would not believe in a final coming of Christ in our future because the voice of the prophets taught nothing about that, and Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Now in our first debate, Bill said that Paul quoted from Old Testament texts and the new meaning was not respective of the particular context from which they were quoted. That is absolutely ridiculous. To argue, for a gospel preacher to argue that the New Testament is inventing new doctrines out of Old Testament phrases is simply not correct. Now, a Muslim might argue that, or a Jew might argue that, but a Christian ought not argue that. He argued from Romans chapter 10, verse 18. Their sound has gone out into all the world. And he said that meant something different than it did in Psalm 19, verse 4, uh, that their uh, sound had gone out, in, out into all the world. It means the same thing, Bill. It means the same thing. In Psalm 19, there's natural revelation. It's clear enough to those who will look for it, but only the honest can assess it, and many will reject it, or at least some will reject it. The same thing with Romans 10, 18. In now, special revelation through the gospel, their sound has gone out in the world. There's enough information to accept it. Some have not obeyed. They have not all obeyed the gospel, the Bible says, in that particular context. You said that in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, how beautiful upon the fountains are the feet of him who brings news. You said that was simply the uh, return from Babylonian captivity. He doesn't know the voice of the prophets. He doesn't know the voice of the prophets. In Isaiah 52 and verse 7, Therefore they shall know on that day that I am him who speaks, behold, he is I, so he shall sprinkle many nations. So wait a minute now. So a king after the Babylonian captivity is going to sprinkle the many nations for sacrifices that are all going to be forgiven. Is that your position? Is that what you're arguing? You said that was the return from Babylonian captivity. He doesn't know the voice of the prophets. That is his problem. Let me give you a little help with the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible has 66 books. The first 39 chapters are about the judgment of old covenant Israel. The next 27 chapters are about the reign of the Messiah. 
I suggest to you he doesn't know the voice of the prophets, and that's why he is in error. Now, I argued in my last debate that every New Testament writer quoted in context. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. Bill doesn't have a right to take Isaiah 44 out of its context, hammer and tongs making an idol and making a new doctrine of it, any more than I have a right to quote a New Testament text out of its context. Bill Lockwood does not know the voice of the prophets. Any futurist does not know the voice of the prophets. Now, I argued last time that in the Olivet Discourse, if I can demonstrate that it is not divided, that there is no division in the Olivet Discourse, then I have proven beyond any shadow of a doubt that there's no future coming of Christ. And the Olivet Discourse is not divided. Now, Jesus was speaking about a very unique time of Jewish persecution. He would say in Matthew 24 and verse 21, So then there shall come great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to that time nor shall ever be. Jesus said the greatest persecution that would ever take place would take place before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Jesus called it the time of sorrows. It's often translated birth pangs. Mine says birth pangs. What Jesus is saying when he said, no one knows the day and the hour, it is like the birth pangs of a woman. When a woman is pregnant, as the birth pangs become greater and more severe and closer together, the hour approaches. The husband and wife do not know. They do not know the day and the hour, but they know that it's near. And so when the gospel teaches that Jesus would return to the generation that he lived, and James said the coming of the Lord is at hand, the birth pangs were upon them. Now, the Bible teaches that that generation would not pass away till all these things take place, Matthew 24, 34, a generation is 40 years. Our position is that the last days are A.D. 30 to A.D. 70. Those are the last days where the Holy Spirit in his miraculous work was promised to work, then the consummation of the age. Now I want you to consider Jeremiah 30, verses 6 and 7. Jeremiah predicts the time that Jesus was alluding to. Please notice. Ask now and see whether a man is ever with child. So why do I see every man with his hand on his loins, like a woman in labor, and all faces turn pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is a time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, it should be Jacob's trouble. That's not uh, typed up right. Sorry about that. In the latter days, he says, you will consider it. Jeremiah is predicting a great day unequaled in Israel's history. You cannot have two great days unequaled in Jewish history and not refer to the same day without a flat contradiction. No, Jesus is referring to Jacob's trouble. In that time, it will be like a woman in labor. In the latter days, 80-30, 80-70, that's when they would consider it and the birth pang. Now notice 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as labor pains upon a woman, and they shall not escape. The Thessalonians were enduring a Jewish persecution. Acts chapter 17, read your Bible. And the Jews troubled them. And those troublers who were troubling them would soon, would soon have the persecution turned back on, the, on those Jews who troubled them. When Paul says in Acts 8, 22 and 23, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. He's not talking about the rocks and the trees and the birds and the, tree, uh, the bees. He's talking about the old covenant world. They are in their birth pangs. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Every man has his hand on his lines. He is now birthing a new reality, you see. The Bible speaks about the time of adoption. Not only that, we all sell, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, that's the Jewish church right there, Jewish Christian, first fruits of the Spirit. Even ourselves grown with ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and redemption of our body. Now that's in their future. They're waiting for the adoption and the redemption. They're promised redemption because they have the sealing of the Spirit. But soon the redemption of our body. Bill Lockwood has the unenviable position to affirm before you that your physical body needs to be redeemed at the end of time. I suggest to you that is a false idea. First of all, there was only one body, 
And that body was transitioning. That's the old covenant body to the new covenant body. And the Spirit was doing His miraculous work for 40 years. He doesn't know the voice of the prophets, and therefore He comes up with a physical coming at the end of time. As a matter of fact, my opponent's position demands a miracle could take place at any time. Jesus could come, come back now. Were you thinking about the return of Christ? Were you eagerly awaiting the return of Christ, as all good Christians were? Thank you. Or was it the case that they were eagerly awaiting for the redemption of the body? It is the old covenant body that had died had come back to life. When Paul says, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God, he was referencing the same time period. And by the way, your physical body doesn't harbor sin. You've got sin in your body right now? It's unforgiven? Why do you need your body redeemed? Your physical body redeemed at the end of time? I don't think that works, Bill. Now, I argued in my last debate that Zechariah 14 is the second coming of Christ. He said it was a parabolic picture of the church. Let's see if that makes sense. First of all, Zechariah said, it shall be one day known to the Lord. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 36, but at that day and hour knows no man. I affirm it's the same time. It's the same time. Because we don't know the voice of the prophets, we assume when Jesus said, but at that day and that hour, he's talking about the future somewhere where Jesus will return in a miracle. That's balderdash. The Bible teaches the one day known to the Lord is in the fall of Jerusalem. I will gather all nations and the city shall be taken. Jesus said one shall be taken. Brother Bill Lockwood thinks at the end of time one's taken in a rapture and one's left. But the Bible uses the term in the exactly opposite way. Everyone who is left among the nations. The ones who are left are the ones who are saved. The ones who are taken are the ones who are taken into captivity. Zechariah 14, 16. Jesus is alluding to Zechariah 14. It is the second coming of Christ. One taken, one left is not a rapture at the end of time, but a Jewish metaphor of national judgment at the time of the end of Old Covenant Israel. Let's go up. So now, Zechariah 14, 2. Bill Lockwood. How much time do I have, William? Bill Lockwood said in Zechariah 14, 2, that's a picture of the church. Now I want you women to think about this now. If that's the picture of the church, the house is rifled and the women ravished, then you women ought to think about the glorious act of rape when you're baptized into Christ. He's talking about national judgment. They're in that birth pang period. Think 40 years. A woman's gestation period is 40 weeks. Old covenant Israel was gestating for 40 years. And I know it. And they were looking for a new reality. Zechariah said their houses would be rifled. Their women would be ravished. It is national judgment language. Isaiah 13, 8. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. Their houses will be rifled and their wives ravished. And Babylon fell in 539 B.C. by the Medes and the Persians. It's national judgment language. And because he doesn't know the voice of the prophets, he is mistaken in his view. Zechariah 14, verse 5, Thus my Lord will come all the saints with you. When Jesus returned in AD 70, when the temple fell, the dead saints were raised. Zechariah chapter 14, and verse 5, proves it. It fits perfectly with the law and the prophets. Our views fit perfectly with the law and the prophets. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 31, He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's resurrection. He doesn't understand the voice of the prophets. Matthew 24 and verse 31 is when they were all gathered together. Now notice, please, if I can demonstrate that the Olivet Discourse is not divided, and it's not divided, my opponent's position falls, and I have proven my proposition. Now please notice, Luke 17, 30, and 31. How much time, William? Thank you. Jesus said, Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he was on the house, stop his goods in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who was in the field, let him not return back. Bill said in the last debate, that's the end of time. Look what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse. He says, This is the destruction of Jerusalem. Then let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the house stop not take anything out of his house. And let not who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. He says that event and this event are different events. It is because he doesn't know the voice of the prophets. One left, one taken is simply national judgment language. Go up on to Luke 21 and verse 27. 
in the destruction of Jerusalem, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But according to Bill Ockward, that's not enough cloud, uh, not enough power, and not a great glory to be the second and final coming of Christ. Well, what is it? The 1.5 coming? Remember me asking you that question? 1.75 coming, 1.8 coming, 1.9 coming, but not the second coming. According to Bill Lockwood, that's the second coming. And when was the kingdom consummated? Bill Lockwood said in our first debate that the kingdom here, that's simply the realm. I don't know the realm and the reign of Christ. The Bible says, so when you see these things happening, know the kingdom of God is near. It's the only time that our Lord said the kingdom comes with a specific event, and he's having reference to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. The kingdom comes proleptically. It's like a mustard seed. It grows from a little seed to a big event. Thank you so much for your attention.
is employed by the Wichita Falls Independent School District as an instructor in juvenile detention. So it is my privilege to introduce uh, for this debate, Brother Bill Lockwood. Let me have chart number four and five, and this is uh, this is where I wanted to. Turn I want to go, but this is Dr. William Ermey. Now, historically, this has never been heard in the churches. Period in all the world until. to set forth this view was Dr. I uh, Israel Warren, the Christian mayor, and a congregational minister in this the Parousia, whose view has able supporters in the Dr. J. Stuart Russell, 
a brother Congregationalist, in his the Parousia, and in the late Dr. William S. Ermey of the California Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church, in his book, Christ Came Again. That was at the turn of the last century, as you can see. What happened? Well, here is what Edward Faulkner says, who wrote this comment. He says, and he's an historian, having searched through the church history, he says the fact that Dr. Ermey was never compelled to retract his opinion or withdraw his book, never tried for heresy, has the significance of a revolution in the attitude of the Methodist church toward heresy. For speaking historically, it is hardly too much to say that the belief in Christ's first coming has not been more general, more firmly held, more firmly part of the consciously or unconsciously held doctrinal possessions of the church from the apostolic times until now than the belief in the second coming at the end of the age of the world, not simply AD 70, this is Faulkner's words, for rain or for judgment or for both. The denying that is something like denying, Cal false denying that Christ ever existed. He said it is so historically clear that this has been the historical understanding of Christianity from the first century until now. So really what we're talking about is something that is very new on the scene. And that's exactly what I wanted you to think about. But let's consider also one more, and that is uh, number one and two. This is what I call King's Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone, let's go back to number one. Uh, Max King, as the man I referred to here, who fathered in the Churches of Christ. The Rosetta Stone, as you know, was discovered in Egypt and was able, they were able by the stone to interpret hieroglyphics and it really was a, a key that unlocked all the mysteries of hieroglyphics. Well, the Rosetta Stone is that we're going to take all passages and interpret them as Holger just did in one single solitary fashion run right through that funnel. So. Notice in the Bible, there are parables in the Old and New Testament. You can see the passages. They are explanations of the parables. Are we to interpret the explanations the same way as we do the parables? No. How about the types? Type prophecies, Joel 3. I believe that's a type. Same thing with non-figures. There is Zechariah 9 and 9. The king, he should come meek and lowly, riding upon an ass, the colt, the fold of an ass. I ask you, what is the interpretive principle? What is the fundamental rule that Brother Holder has by which he comes to the Old Testament, he says, I don't understand the Old Testament. Well, what is it, Brother Holger? What is the interpretive rule by which you can make a determination, this is literal and this is not. This is a parable and this is not. This is applied to that age and this is not. There's only one way to really make that determination, and that is the New Testament application of those prophecies. That's really the final arbiter, isn't it? But really, that is not what is done here. What is done is we're just running them all through the funnel. Let's go to the next chart here. I pointed out at the bottom of the last one, too, that the New Testament tells us that the Old Testament prophets wrote in diverse portions and in divers, that is, different manners. You cannot interpret everything exactly the same way. Now, look into this for just a moment. All prophecy interpreted in only one manner. This is Max King. The spiritual is the basic, the spiritual. We're going to take it all in a spiritual sense. The basic and primary method of interpretation involved in end-time prophecy. Who made that rule? Max King did. From which did he get it? His own mind. Where did it come from? The scripture? No, it doesn't come from the scripture. There's not a passage that teaches that. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that. Yet they say, well, I don't understand the scriptures. Well, this is their interpretive rule, and that's how they've operated here this evening. All right, let's uh, con uh, to consider a couple of other things here very quickly, and that is his questions. I want to go to his questions here for a moment. I do, I do not ask these questions in order to be ugly or to be unkind or to put anybody on the spot in the sense that I want... Uh, to make him look bad. But nevertheless, I think it does. And I hear the questions that I've asked him, and he's answered the questions for me. Let me start with this one right here. Since you said in the last debate, and I will part, that you hope to go be with Christ when you die, and you cited Philippians 1, 21 through 23, in connection with that hope, it is possible a, and I had boxes by it, a child of God to so sin as to fall from grace today and be lost. And he said, yes, that's possible. Okay, I agree with that. Then I said also, B, for a child of God who has already gone, died to be with Christ after this life, to lose that place of being with Christ. He said, yes, it's possible. It is possible to fall from grace here. It's possible to fall from grace there. It's possible for us to lose our salvation, be a Christian on the road to heaven, and yet end up going to the other place while on this life, in this life. And it's also possible on the other side of death to do exactly the same thing. What does that mean? That means that the devil is over there, that sin is there, because sin is the only thing that causes you to fall, isn't it? 
Is there something else? Sin is that which causes you to fall. That means what? That means if it's possible after you die and you're in with Christ, at that point, to lose your salvation, that means it's possible to sin. How can that possibly be? I want him to explain that. This is what this doctrine gets you. This is where it ends up. And so I think that he needs to explain that a little bit. Now, he did put a note on here. He says, like Proverbs 22 and 6, is possible but not likely. Love will always, uh, always uh, exist, which demands reciprocity. Well, that may be, that's good and fine. But nevertheless, it still is possible. All right, here's another question I asked him. He didn't finish the question out. Uh, he may not have noted it, but I'm Holger Neubauer, Bauer, and right now in heaven, and I ask, true, check the box of true, leave it blank if it's false. Great is your reward in heaven, Matthew 5 and 12. Enjoying the heavenly reward, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. He says that is true. So I ask the question, when did you enter that reward? If true, when did you enter the reward? I want to know. Was it when he became, now here's the reason I ask it. So I'll just go on with it here. Was it when he became a Christian? Is that the case? Now, Holger Neubauer became a Christian many years ago. But he did not believe and realize eschatology. He thought it was false doctrine, apparently. Or at least he did not believe it. So he entered into heaven when he became a Christian, and yet he didn't believe the doctrine at all? Is that the case? He's in heaven, doesn't know he's in heaven. He's in heaven, doesn't believe he's in heaven. He would argue against it that he's in heaven, yet he's really in heaven. Now, is that what happened? I want to know. Or is it the case that he entered into heaven when he was converted by someone who ever influenced him on realized eschatology? When, when did that occur? That means that when he became, if, if so, that means when he became a Christian, I don't know how old he was, let's say he was 15 years old when he became a Christian, he was actually lost. He was, in, he was actually with the devil. And yet, when he was converted to this doctrine, he entered into heaven. That means to say that if you came into this building and you're lost, you're in hell. But if you leave the building, if you believe his doctrine, then you can leave being in heaven. Believe it, who can? There's, a, there's no difference here. Is that, that is really what this boils down to. So those are the questions that I've asked him. If he wants to say somewhat about them, then I would be happy for him to do so. I have another question on John 14, but I wanted to get to his material before I ran out of time. All right, let's look at a couple of things here. He says, I believe the same thing that, uh, as did the Jews, and that is a physical kingdom. No, I don't either. I believe it's a spiritual kingdom. That was a, that's a false charge. I believe it's a spiritual kingdom. That's true. Acts chapter 26, verses 22 and 23. Paul says, having therefore obtained the help that is from God, I stand unto this day testifying both the small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses did say should come. By the way, here's a good point. Brother Don Preston, who's here, tells us in his book that all of the Old Testament is simply repeated in the New. And it's all the hope of Israel. And it has to do with, so that's the excuse for going back to the Old Testament and taking all the Old Testament passages and applying them to us today in the same sense. That's why they do it. That's the hope of Israel. Here, Paul tells us what is the hope of Israel. Listen carefully. Having therefore obtained the help that is from God, I stand unto this day, testifying both the small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses did say should come, that the Christ should what? Suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name unto all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. What did the Old Testament prophets prophesy? What Paul was preaching, and that is also to the Gentiles. By the way, he does not believe the Gentiles were in yet. They couldn't come in until 70. Yet Paul says, this is what the prophets prophesied. And what is it? That Christ must suffer, die, resurrect, and the gospel would be preached unto the Gentile people. And that's the gospel. As a matter of fact, that, that promise of the Old Testament has already been fulfilled. For example, in Acts chapter 13 in Antioch of Pisidia, Paul, the same preacher, tells us this. He tells us that that has been now fulfilled. The promise which was given unto your fathers has been fulfilled. Brother Neubauer says, no, that's not so. And that's not so, Paul. It's not fulfilled until A.D. 70. Paul says, no, it's now been fulfilled. That's interesting. All right, let's look also at this one. He says, hammer and tongs. <laughs> I'm glad he kept that copy of hammer and tongs. <laughs> he says, I don't know the prophet. You know what? I didn't get, the, I didn't get uh, any idea from the Bible. I mean, I got it from the farrier field, and I was just, I was tacking shoes on horses sometimes, and I liked it, so I called it hammer and tongs. It had nothing to do with the Bible on that one. All right. 
I just did that for fun. All right, uh, now let's look at this. He says, now let's look at uh, chart number three. He says, I don't know the voice of the Old Testament prophets. Let's see here regarding this. Here's the Old Testament analogies. Notice there are figurative comings in the Old Testament. There are many of them. Isaiah 31, Micah 1 and 3, Zechariah 2. Are these figurative as well? Zechariah 9 and 9, Micah 5. No, they're not figurative either. Uh, they're not figurative as well. There are literal comings and they're figurative. In other words, in the Old Testament, there's a distinction to be made between the figurative and the literal. Now, I want very quickly to get to Zechariah 14. He made a big deal on Zechariah 14, so I'm going to spend a few moments on it. Now, I do believe that it is, and by the way, he misinterpreted, mis misquoted, misstated what I had to say regarding Zechariah 14, as well as the passages in Romans. I did not say anything about them having a new meaning. <laughs> I did never said that. That's not what I said. I said they were types. They were types. And we'll so, show that to be the case right now. The Old Testament prophets were types. They, all had, they were all types of what would come later. For example, let me give you an illustration just, just to show you. In Hosea chapter 9 and verse 3, as well as in chapter 9 and verse 6, we're told by Hosea that they would go to Egypt to captivity again. The people would be, really? No, they would not go to Egypt. They're going to Assyrian captivity when Hosea spoke and proph prophesied. And he says in chapter 11 and verse 5, Hosea says, you will not go to Egypt. But you will go to Assyria. Well, which time did Hosea get it right? Well, both times. Because Assyria was typed by Egypt. In other words, he said, you'll go back to Egypt, but that was only a type of Assyrian captivity. And that is the case regarding so many prophecies in Hosea, as well as Zechariah and other passages as well. Zechariah chapter 14. It is not literally of the destruction of Jerusalem. We, don't, we have, for example, in verses 2 and 3 of Zechariah 14, that the whole city would not be taken. There was a third of the city would be spared. Furthermore, we have this, the fact of the case is that it is an expansion of Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, which is simply a picture of the church in typology. It's not literal. He asked about the women being ravished. No, it's only a typology. Just the same as bells on the horses would be marked with holy to Jehovah in chapter 14, verses 20 and 21. Literally, no, no, it's all a type. It's all a type, and that's all that Zechariah 14 has. By the way, before we move on any further, what was the argument that he made that said Jesus Christ is coming the second and final time of the destruction of Jerusalem? What was the argument that he made? You couldn't tell me the major premise, the minor premise. You couldn't tell me what the argument was. Now, he went through a lot of passages, but they have really nothing to do with it at all as far as proving a proposition. He made a lot of assertions. For example, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, let's look at that chart, C8. C8, he says, Matthew 24 and 25, he says, it's all one time frame. No, not, not at all. Uh, no, it's the next one. It's 24 and 25 of Matthew. Well, I, no, I'm sorry. Maybe it's, maybe it's not that one. There it is. Okay. Look here. We have in the destruction of Jerusalem, we have on this left-hand side of the chart, the destruction of Jerusalem. There is a dividing line at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. One is a local event, the other is universal. Disciples have fled to the mountains, all have gathered before him. There are two different events spoken here. By the way, that shows us something else important. He asked me about Isaiah chapter 52 and chapter 53. Did you note that? He says, Bill, is this one, is this one the, uh, this, the uh, second coming of Christ? Let's see, this is Isaiah 52. And in that particular passage, uh, which starts off really at chapter 52 and verse 11, Depart ye, depart ye, go out from this, touch no unclean thing. What's that referring to? That's leave Babylonian captivity. That's a prophecy. By the way, it was spoken to what people that would never really hear it. That was audibly spoken to these people before the captivity occurred. Get out of captivity. But then, verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal wisely, and exalted and be lifted up, and shall be very high. I believe that's the Messiah. I believe that to be the case. And so he's misfiring on that particular point. Romans chapter 8. Verses 22 and 23 says at the time of Jacob's trouble. That's an assertion. He has no proof of that at all. We'll talk more about Jer uh, Romans chapter 8 in a few moments. Uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 31. The kingdom of God comes near. I did make the point in the last debate, and I see that he missed it, and that is simply this, that there is in the Old Testament the usage of the word kingdom or the phrase kingdom of God. It refers to the reign of Christ almost 100% of the time and not a particular vicinity or realm. And that's the way the word 
kingdom is you. So also it means in the book of Revelation, so also it means in Luke chapter 21 verse 31, the kingdom of God is near, meaning simply that the reign of God is here. God is showing himself. That's all that that passage means. It has nothing to do with the kingdom, the church coming at 70 at all. And those passages from the Old Testament do not prove that. All right, now I want to get in something here. How much time do I have to? Let me go into something here. I'm going to offer this for his consideration. When we get back, we're getting back to that question, which is uh, one of them that I asked him a moment ago. And that is John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Now I said this. When Jesus said, I will go prepare a place for you. Uh, the chart is, uh, let's see, the chart is uh, number... Uh, Chart number five, fifty-eight and 59. All right, here's the question. When Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, he actually meant he was departing from the world below, John 8, 23, which is the Jewish world and referred to the new covenant temple of God to be completed at AD 70. Don Preston said that in his book, when there would be more spiritual communion with the Father. Now get this. He says that is true. All right. This is all about spiritual communion. I want you to, I want you to feel this for just a moment. I think this is next to blasphemous, really. He says that the Lord was leaving and he was going to go for a spiritual communion with the Father. But Paul de Neubauer now has that spiritual communion with the Father. He has more communion with the Father now than when our Lord, that our Lord had when he spoke those words. Now that's hard to believe. But that's the position he has to take because John 14 is not referring to a communion with the Father, he's referring to a location. So it's a departure, I'm leaving. It is a destination, I go, I'm going to the Father. It's a reunion. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I'm leaving, and it's a bodily, personally. Were they concerned about their communion with the Father when he says, I go unto the Father? Is that what they were concerned about? No, they were not concerned about that. They were concerned about the fact that he was leaving them Bodily, he was leaving them in a local sense. Let's go to the next chart very quickly. And that is, look at these passages in John 7, 33. I go to the Father. What does that mean? Or what if I ascend to where I was before? John 6 and 62. I am from above. John 8 and 23. He should depart out of this world unto the Father. What does that mean? Then he says, I will come and get you, receive you, take you unto myself that where I am you may be also. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we'll take five minutes, and then uh, Ogre will have his next speech. So five uh -huh. minutes. Okay.
So we need some more work. Probably. Okay. I'm dry. I used to be Pentecostal, you're not good. I don't run so much, I'm trying to keep up with you now. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've got about 30 seconds, please be finding your seats and we'll get it uh, underway. I'm glad to be able to stand before you for this second speech, affirm what I believe, and I think that I did, to find the proposition very, very well. The second and final return took place when Jerusalem fell. Now, if the Olivet Discourse, that means Matthew 24, Luke 17, Luke 21, Mark 13, and by the way, John doesn't have the Olivet Discourse because the book of Revelation is his Olivet Discourse. Right? If there's no division in the Olivet Discourse, his proposition falls because there's not another coming from which the New Testament writers wrote. Now, I think I said that pretty clearly, Bill, in all due respect. If it's the case that there is no division in the Olivet Discourse, then there is not another coming from which the New Testament writers can draw from. And there is not a division in the Olivet Discourse. I've demonstrated that Jesus is a Jewish prophet using Jewish language, fulfilling the Old Covenant law. And when Jesus said one left and one taken, it's Jewish judgment language. The one who is left is the one who was spared. Noah is spared. All right? Lot is spared. The one who is taken, the one is taken in judgment. Now, Bill believes at the end of time, somebody's going to be raptured up. Whoop! That's what he believes. He believes you can be whooped up right now. As a matter of fact, Jesus can return and whoop you up. Okay? Then someone is left behind for judgment. But you see, Jesus uses the language exactly in the opposite way. He's saying one is taken into captivity, just like Zechariah said. And one is left, one is spared, like Noah. Now, who was left? Noah was left, you see. Lot was left. When I, uh, uh, Elijah said, I am left, he said, I'm the only one who is spared. In 2 Kings 17, 18, we find that Judah is left alone. Verse 33, Israel is taken. So when would this take place? Well, it would take place where the eagles are gathered together. Now, in Matthew 24 and 28, Jesus said, where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. He says that's the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, and I would agree. But in Luke 17, 37, where the body is, the eagles are gathered together. He said, no, 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 no. He believes that's when you're whooping up. Okay, that's when you're taken up. All right? No, it's the same reference to the old covenant body. So the old covenant body of people had died. The ancients were more wont to talk about a relationship to a people. Okay? A covenant and a body. A head and a body. Right? The head of Damascus is Syria. The head of Syria is Remaliah. The head of uh, Ephraim. Uh, Samaria, Ephraim is the Samaria. The head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. Um, so, uh, I may have got that exactly right, but the, the concept is head, body, head, body. Now, Christ is the head, right? And the body is the church. Well, they have that same concept. When will the old covenant body be completely destroyed and unable to persecute? 
Jesus said, where the body is, there will be the eagles gathered together. Now, he says that I pour everything into AD 70. He pours everything into AD 33. Did you hear him? He said in Zechariah chapter 14, it's a picture of the church. It is simply a parable. It is an illustration. I don't even know how you can get women ravished in Acts chapter 2. That's Jewish judgment language. You can discuss this with your wife tonight, how she needs to think about being baptized into Christ and being ravished. No, 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 no. You know that's silly. You know that's unbalanced. A woman is ravished because she's raped. That's national judgment language. So when the Medes and the Persians came in to Babylon in 539 B.C., guess what they did? They ravished the women. And the houses were taken. Zechariah said in Zechariah 14, 2, the houses are rifled and the women are ravished. What will take place? They will flee to the mountains. Zechariah 14, verse 5. He says it's got nothing to do with the destruction of Jerusalem. It has everything to do with the destruction of of Jerusalem because that's when they would flee to the mountains Zechariah 14 5 now Zechariah 14 7 says one day known unto the Lord uh, to the Lord where it's neither day nor light right now the covenants are changing he doesn't know the voice of the prophets I know he doesn't know the voice of the prophets and yes that's the only hammer and tongs I kept I don't know why but I kept that hammer and tongs and I'm glad to for him to be honest and to say it had nothing to do with the Bible because, in fact, it had nothing to do with the Bible. Hammer and tongs is, has an idolatrous background to it. Now, let me suggest to you, I know you're a horseman, and I know you love horses and all that kind of thing. But if you were a first century Christian, you would not have used hammer and tongs, I guarantee you. You would not have done that. Okay, let's, uh, now, this is good humor, okay? I'm not trying to be mean. No, that's all right. You know, and, uh, but I asked somebody to help me with this. This is a picture of Bill, of course. He says, I usually don't, uh, I don't usually pound my futures items into the table. It's one. And when I do, I usually use my hammer and his tongs. That's exactly right. His hammer and tong mentality is to take an Old Testament verse and uh, not respect the context. But he said it had nothing to do with the Bible. Well, okay. Hammer and tongs in the Bible is an idolatrous uh, uh, background. Now, I'll tell you what, I'm feeling very confident these days about my Bible. Dude. But, um, I'm reading through Isaiah chapter 44. Now, I suggest that you never read Isaiah 44 carefully, or you never would have used hammer and tongs. So that's exhibit A. He doesn't know the voice of the prophet. He certainly doesn't know Zechariah chapter 14. Now, look at verse 7, please. Of Zechariah 14, all right? Zechariah 14, verse 7. A day known only... Uh, where are we? Back up. All right, I'll tell you what. Zechariah 14, 7, a day known only to the Lord, where it's neither dark nor light, but in evening time it shall be light, because the covenant is changing. So in 1 John 2 and verse 18, the darkness is passing away. It was the darkness of the age, and soon a new age would be born. That's the idea. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord. Jesus is quoting from this in Matthew 24, 36. That's the passage he is alluding to. And in that day, look what he says, living water shall flow from Jerusalem, verse 8. He's not talking about Pentecost. He says, I pour everything into this diabolic AD 70 idea, apocalyptic funnel. He pours everything to AD 33. He has an AD 33 theory, and he's a hupa preterist is what he is. Hyper means too much, right? Hupa means under. You're a hupa preterist, Bill. And he pours everything into AD 33. Well, you can't pour everything into AD 33. And he has the brazen gall to say that women are ravished. Women are ravished. Women are ravished. Please think women. Think of the church. It's parabolic and the horses with bells. Listen, the imagery is coming to Jerusalem and now it's rejoicing. Why? Because salvation comes. Zechariah 14 and verse 8. In that day shall be living water, shall flow from Jerusalem, half them toward the eastern sea. He's quoting, he's quoting uh, this, this idea from Zechariah 13, 1. That's when salvation finally arrives. It's simply proleptical, you see. So the Bible teaches, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. All right? That's still true. But they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. 
The guarantee that full salvation would arrive. And so when he would appear a second time without sin unto salvation, that salvation finally arrived and heaven was opened. Now Bill believes that full salvation was opened in Acts chapter 2. That they had full salvation in Acts chapter 2. But guess what? He can't go to heaven yet. Can't go to heaven until the judgment. Can't go to heaven. He's got full salvation. Can't go to heaven. No, 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 no. When Jesus returned, and the temple fell, the one in heaven was opened in heaven. It was. Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead which die from now on. And it's the judgment of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, I think Bill believes in Wallace's view. I think he does. Well, heaven is open, Zechariah 14, uh, Revelation 14, 13. Revelation 15, 5, Revelation 15, 8. It's the same thing. They die from now on. Why does he say that? When Jesus returned and that last stone was pried off of its moorings, the end had come. The end had come. Again, he's got more ends than old McDonald's. Here an end, there an end, everywhere an end, end. No, 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 no. One great end. And it brought forward salvation. Now, the Bible says, 1 John 5, 13, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, right? The commandments are not uh, grievous. 1 John 5, 3. 1 John 5 and verse uh, 13. These things have I written unto you. Believe on the name of God that you may know you have eternal life. Now the promise of eternal life is proleptical. They had the sealing of the Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of what was coming. So the nature of salvation doesn't change, okay? It's simply the completion of the same kind of salvation that Jesus offered to begin with. So as they are saved, the Holy Spirit seals them as a guarantee until complete salvation arrives. And that's why the, in the destruction of Jerusalem, that's why we have this picture of the fountains, the living waters being poured forth on that day. We have historically said in Churches of Christ that Zechariah 13.1, that there's a fountain open for sin and uncleanness in Jerusalem. It points to Pentecost. He's pouring everything into his AD 33 theory. But it won't work because it says, and the unclean spirit will pass out of the land at that day. He says in Zechariah chapter 13, 5, they no longer will wear a rough garment to deceive. He's speaking about the prophetic office. When would the prophetic office end? The prophetic office will end at the return of Christ. And Jesus said that he was coming in clouds with power and great glory. Luke 21, 27. In the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, you see. Zechariah 13 and uh, 14, 12, 13, 14 are a composite whole. Seven times he speaks about the day of the Lord. He's not talking about Pentecost. He has an AD 33 theory. He pours everything into AD 33. I used to do that. I used to do the same thing. And I'll tell you what, when I finally understood Zechariah 14, 7, a day known only to the Lord, and put that together with the Olivet Discourse, it made perfect sense. His doctrine doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Now, we've all had Eureka moments. You remember, you accused me of Eureka moments. Yeah, I've had Eureka moments. Let me tell you a Eureka moment. For years, I preached from Hebrews 11, verse 21. Jacob, while he's dying, leans upon his staff and he worships. I see the staff. I think of a shepherd's staff. I say, this is a great text. I get my brethren to church service. Jacob is simply leaning on his staff and he's worshiping. He must have gone to a familiar place to bless both the sons of Joseph. Problem is, that's not what that text teaches. I'm reading through the Old Testament about 20 years ago now, and I come across Genesis chapter 48, and Jacob is on his bed. He's blessing both the sons of Joseph. They come between his knees. He hadn't seen his grandsons yet, Manasseh and Ephraim, and he's on his bed staff. And Homer Neubauer had a eureka moment. I hope you have a eureka moment. Yes, I changed my mind because I want to know the voice of the prophets. The Bible says, with all your getting, get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7. Now, you need to follow my arguments a whole lot better. Um, really. I want you to discuss Matthew 24, 28. And Luke 17, 37. I want you to tell me why those are two different events. All right? I want you to demonstrate 
He which is on his housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take his goods. In Luke 17, and verse 30. And why that's not the same thing in Matthew 24, 16, and 17. And in verses 16 and 17, he surely says, flee to the mountains. You tell me why those are different events. Through exegesis and explanation, he said last time, well, the idea of Luke 17 is like the man in Luke chapter 9, who he's plowing, and then he returns back. That's the idea. Listen, you believe it will take place in the twinkling of an eye. That's what you believe. So how is it now? A guy's on his housetop. It comes in the twinkling of an eye, and he looks down to get his stuff and gets goods in the house. You're going to explain that? You're going to say that's a different event than Matthew chapter 24, and it's not. You're being inconsistent. It's not, Bill. It's the same event. There's only one second coming, and it procures the purposes of God. Now, I want... Uh, Joshua chapter 5, please. Just, just the text itself. How much time do I have? Five minutes, 30 seconds. All right. The Old Testament contains the types and the shadows of what's in the New Testament. And our teaching fit perfectly with the types and the shadows. This is an important time in Old Covenant uh, history because they're entering into the land. There's been this 40-year transition, all right? So I want you to notice something now. In Joshua chapter 5 and verse 3, Joshua made flint nine for himself, circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. Go on to verse 5 and 6 now. In 7. So verse 6, the children of Israel walked for 40 years. Right? Now, now, now notice the, the picture. They have now transitioned for 40 years. They come into the land. Now notice in verse uh, 7 and 8, they're circumcised again. Verse uh, 8 and, and 9. Notice what he says now. This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Are you seeing this? Forty years earlier, he's rolling the reproach away. The New Testament type is the same. The rolling of the approach, that's when heaven is opened and eternal life is obtained. And when Jesus said, he that lives and believes in me shall never die, that's true now. You will not die in Christ and heaven is opened. Why is it if you have full salvation, you can't go to heaven? Will you please answer? I want you to answer, Bill Lockwood. Answer me. Now, notice what happens when he rolled away the reproach. Give me verse 12. And the manna ceased. Ah, a picture of the miraculous gifts ceasing. Forty years, the Holy Spirit is poured out for the last days of Israel. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And they're doing that in the New Testament. That's the type. The New Testament. And you said type. Did he say type? Did you hear Bill Lockwood say it's a type? Well, here's the type. Here it is, Mr. Bill Lockwood. Brother Bill, I appreciate you, by the way. <laughs> all right, keep on going on. Now, notice who he meets in verse 14. You said it was a type. Bill Lockwood said it's a type. All right, just be consistent. Now as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Joshua fell on his face in worship and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, and the place where you stand is holy. That's a Christophany. And you know exactly what a Christophany is. It's a Christ appearing in the Old Testament, 40-year transition, sins are rolled away. Yeah, the type has to be fulfilled. You see? It makes perfect sense, my friend. It makes perfect sense. Now, please, that's what we're saying. Do you see, do you see the picture? All right? Sins rolled away. Sins rolled away. 40 years. He meets the Lord. Do you know how I know he meets the Lord? Because only God can be worshipped. Only Jesus can be worshipped. Jesus appears. And that type and that shadow is repeated in the New Testament. That is exactly what he does. He says in AD 70, it's invented by Max King. That's not true. Cyrus Vance, 100 years ago in California, taught the return of the Lord. But do you know that in 1800s, during the Restoration Movement, everyone believed in original sin? Do you know that? And so they said to Campbell, where have you come up with this doctrine? Oh, it's new. It's brand new. Did you know that the Catholics believe in original sin? Did you know that the Methodists believe in original sin? Did you know the Presbyterians believe in original sin? Do you know the Baptists believe in original sin? And did you know that Origen believed in original sin? Tertullian believed in infant baptism. Hippolytus, 215, believed in um, uh, infant baptism. Irenaeus believed in infant baptism. Clement believed in infant baptism. And Augustine made it the doctrine established throughout the generations. Now, if you've got original sin, then you've got original death. 
If you don't have original sin, then you don't inherit biological death or spiritual death from Adam. That's restoration teaching. That's exactly what that is. And yes, that's a consequence of denying original sin. In churches of Christ, we say no. Paul said, I was alive once without the law of the commandment came to see me revive. I died. That's the death that we have to overcome. It's a death under the law. And see, as life began to be revealed, it was just revealed incrementally. And he says, oh, you can fall from grace in heaven. Listen, this is what I believe. Listen carefully. Love will always exist. That means there's at least the possibility of you determining, which I don't think will ever happen, I think you'll have free will in heaven. He doesn't think you're going to have free will in heaven. I believe in the heavenly age we have free will. I think it's different. I think it's more secure, but the Bible doesn't say much about it. I simply trust God. It is eternal life that I want. Will you quit loving? Will you quit believing in heaven? What are we all going to get just stuck doing something without service? No, no. We're going to be able to love God. And you can, re you can leave any time. We'll say you can leave any time. That's the idea. I don't think we will. I think that we can. And I think we'll always love the Lord. Now, abide love, faith, right, hope. Now, how many hopes do you have? Paul said, I'm bound for the hope of Israel, Acts 28, verse 20. All right, I'm bound for the hope of Israel. There's one hope, it's eternal life. He believes his physical body has to be resurrected at the end of time. Okay, we'll take five minutes, and then uh, Bill will give his second negative. <clears throat> Yeah, so far, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.
Right. <laughs> the time is at hand. <laughs> Todd Upton. <clears throat> Certainly it's good to be before you again uh, for the second negative. And I want to point out a couple of things very quickly and briefly, just overview the whole thing that we just heard. I really never heard an argument that said this is the second and final coming of Jesus Christ. I heard a lot of passages that he had on the screen, went through them, but you didn't hear anything that said, this is the case, this is the case, therefore this is the case. Didn't hear anything like that at all. And you just heard some things regarding Luke 17 and Matthew 24, and then we're back over to Joshua chapter 5. He called that a type. By the way, the New, the New Testament doesn't use it as a type. He calls it a type. That's his uninspired opinion, but the New Testament never so quotes it. So that's something different there we need to know. So at any rate, let's look at a couple of things that we mentioned in the last, and I want to kind of further the same thought. And that is that this is uh, what uh, Joseph Smith said in 1 Nephi chapter 13. Joseph Smith, the Mormon, he says, you know, the plain and most precious portion of the gospel was lost in the dark ages. And so we have it right here. The dark ages, and it was taken away the, by the, the, the abominable church. He meant by that the Catholic church. Lost in the dark ages, that is to say, the abominable church took away the right understanding of Scripture. Before that, therefore, we should find it before the formation of that church. Now, I want you to notice what Max King said in the spirit of prophecy. He said exactly the same thing. This was what Holger's now defending. And I think unsuccessfully, and that is that all comings of Christ, or the second and final coming of Christ, occurred at the destruction of Jerusalem. That's it. He's not coming again. But you know what? Max King said this regarding it. He knew what history said and did not say on the subject. And he said, it was lost in the Dark Ages. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Dark Ages began about 476 A.D. when the Roman Empire fell, the Western Empire. And... What happens? We should find this understanding before we go back behind 476. We should find it, don't we? No, we don't find that at all. That's exactly what we don't find. The reason I know the Book of Mormon is false, one reason I know, is because of that. Same reason I know this is false as well, because he says this is what we need to do, get back to the original understanding. No, you can't find that at all. As, as far back as you go in history, people believed in the second coming of Christ that would be future. And I pointed out in the first speech. Let's look at... Uh, John, uh, let's, well, let's look at a couple of uh, questions here. And I want to look at John chapter 14 for just a moment. Now, I did notice uh, this one. This is uh, John chapter 14, and that is a chart number. Um, uh, maybe it's number 7 or 8, or where is it? I'm not sure which one that is. At any rate, um, I asked him the question when I go prepare. Jesus said, I go prepare a place for you. He actually meant he was departing out of this world and going to the Jewish world. And there would be more spiritual communion with the Father. He said, that's true. Well, he never responded. He never said anything about this. I think that is telling. Why? Well, that is to say that Jesus didn't have that communion with the Father when he went. He was going to have spiritual communion with the Father, but Holger now has more communion with the Father, spiritually speaking, than did our Lord Jesus Christ when he spoke that. I think that's next to blasphemy myself. Here's our Lord who says, I and the Father are one, yet he's, he says his position in John 14 he says, Jesus meant, when I go to the Father, I'm going to have more spiritual communion. Now, the reason he says that is because John chapter 14 has a coming. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. But that cannot be something in the future. Therefore, it has to be something in the past. What are we going to do with it? We're going to have to say spiritual communion. And that's where he is with it. And I can't help him out of that. He's made his own net. He's made his own trap on that one. All right, let's look at a couple of other questions very quickly. I didn't think that he handled these at all. I, didn't think, I thought he was going to say something more about them. I asked him about falling from grace, and also, if when we go to heaven, is it possible to fall? And he said, yes, it is possible. Then, there, then, then we have nothing different than we have now. There's, no, there's nothing different. What kind of reward is it if you have nothing different than you have now? Is that a reward? No, it's not a reward. Listen, our Lord says that he will come and give a reward. That's how it is mentioned in James chapter 1 and verse 12. That is, after you have been tried and have been through tribulation, then you shall receive the crown of life. 
That's the reward. The reward is later. But he says, no, it's not a reward at all. Because you can fall out of it. Now, that's hard to believe, but that is what he has to say in order to maintain his position. And I simply point out that that doctrine, I think, is unpalatable to anybody who would even look at it from the outside at all. Are we to come to the New Testament and to conclude that there's no reward whatsoever? That we're now in heaven, already in heaven? This is it? You know, I mention that to people and they say, what are you talking about? But you know what? It's, it's hard to I, I say, well, that's, that's what he says right here. I have to have to get the papers and show them, I guess. So then I asked the question also regarding, since you're in heaven now, I want to know when you entered into heaven, Holger. He didn't answer that question, did he? He didn't tell us when. When did he go? He didn't tell us when he went to heaven. Was it when he became a Christian? If so, he didn't believe it. He didn't understand it. And yet he says he was in heaven. If he says that was he was there when he became a Christian, he didn't believe it, yet he was there. Hard to understand how someone can accept a doctrine that pushes you that way. I understand there are passages in the Bible that are difficult. Matthew 24, I understand that. I understand Luke 17 is difficult. I believe that to be the case. But I'm not going to take a position that demands I can take another position and another position and another one and say, okay, that's got to be the case. And I've got to follow it all along the way. Now, nevertheless, that's what he says. Now, I want him to tell us, when did you enter into heaven? That was part of the question, and you didn't finish the question. When did you enter, Brother Holder? When did you enter heaven? Was it when you became a Christian, or was it when you were converted to this doctrine? You tell us when you come to the next, please. All right. Now let's look at uh, something regarding Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and that is C, uh, chart number 8, and then we'll look at chart number 7. I believe that there's a difference here. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the Old Testament prophets, you know, Don Preston's here, and he, he does major in, in the Old Testament prophets, write a lot of material on the Old Testament prophets. And they spend a lot of, and Holger spent a lot of time right here in the Old Testament prophets. Which prophet can you cite that did not put things in prophecy in their preaching that applied to that day and then to the future day hundreds of years later? Which prophet did not do that? Can you name one? I bet you can't name one. I bet you can't name one. They all put material that involved those people at that day and then later at another day. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 is all about. He says, come out from among them, touch no unclean thing. What's he talking about? Isaiah 52 and 11. Get out of Babylonian captivity. But then he turns right around and says, my servant shall deal wisely. He shall be lifted up. He shall be exalted and be very high. What did he just do? He jumped about 800 years down to the future. But Holger says, no, our Lord Jesus Christ can't do that. That's impossible to do, or that is something that is illegitimate to do. And so in Matthew 24, it's got to be all the same because that's the people that are listening to the to him speak. Well, look here. There is a difference. And our Lord is not constrained by Brother Neubauer's presuppositions. He speaks about a local event when they're to flee to the mountains. But in Matthew chapter 25, which follows shortly thereafter, it's a universal event. All nations gathered before him. The disciples were to flee to the mountains, Matthew 24, 16. But in Matthew 25, all nations were gathered before him. Everybody see the difference there? The judgment was upon the Jews. As a matter of fact, he says, your house is left unto you empty, gone, desolate. The judgment, however, here would be upon all men, righteous and the unrighteous. Number four, the door of the kingdom would not be closed against the Jews. Romans chapter 11, it would not be closed against the Jews. He tells us that in Romans 11, 30 through 32. But after this, he says, the door would be shut and they would knock on the door and it is too late. Too late. But the door was not shut regarding the Jews. Uh, the door was shut. At, it will be shut at the second coming, but it was not shut after Matthew chapter 24, the destruction of Jerusalem at AD 70. It was not shut to the Jews, was it? No. They can still be saved even today. The preceding and the preceding events would not be normal. They would be unusual events, but here it tells us in Matthew 24, verses 38 to 41, all would be going along in normal. Some would have time to escape. He even tells them, escape. But in this one, in Matthew 24, beginning verse 40, he tells us that there would be no time to escape. They would be, one would be taken, one would be left. It's not a matter of running to the mountains any longer, is it? The parable of the fig tree illustrates this one. The parable of the thief that he mentioned earlier illustrates the other. There is a difference with a major distinction in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Let's look at chart number 7, please, Needham. Chart number 7. Okay, look here for just a moment. There are various comings of Christ. And... Uh, everybody's seen this, or several of you have seen this chart before. 
But I think that this really sets forward the entirety of the whole issue of the Bible. There are many comings of Christ. And go ahead, I'll leave it up there for a moment. You copy those passages down. Tell me what these passages refer to. We have a first coming referred to in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. That's a literal coming, by the way. And most passages in the Old Testament were not to be understood literally, but this one was. Matthew 16 and 28 and John 14 and 18 speaks about the coming on Pentecost. I know we want to disagree on Matthew 16, but John 14 and 18, I come unto you. That's coming on Pentecost. John 14 and 23, he says, those who obey the gospel, those who come, we will come and make me, me and my father, we will come and make our abode with him. If any man hears my word, we will come and make our abode with him. What is that to say? That's to say he's coming in a spiritual communion when we are converted to Christ. Revelation 2 and 5, here's a judgment on the church. I will come and take away the candlestick if you don't repent. There's a conditional coming, so that's not the same. There's a coming in the destruction of Jerusalem. There's a coming in the induction of the Gentiles as well. I want you to notice in Acts chapter 15 and verse 14. This passage is so plain, they were discussing in Jerusalem the entrance of the Gentiles into the church, and here is exactly what was stated. It says here, Simeon rehearsed how first God visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Visited, past tense. God came, visited the Gentiles. When, did, when was he talking about? Acts 10. Acts 10, he's talking about the household of Cornelius. We know that. That's the coming God came to the Gentiles Spiritually speaking, figuratively, so also in Ephesians 2 and 17. He came and preached peace to you that were far off, and peace to them that were nigh. That's something already done, talking about Jews and Gentiles. Christ comes in the gospel preaching. That's a coming also. And then there's the second coming of Christ, standing there watching him ascend into heaven. This same Jesus who was received up into heaven shall so come in like manner as you beheld him going into heaven. There's another coming. You cannot put all comings in one particular package. All right, let's look, at, um, let's look at Zechariah chapter 14 for just a few moments. Zechariah chapter 14, he thinks there's a major passage here for him, but he is sadly mistaken. I say it's a picture of the church. Now, he made, uh, tried to make a big point regarding women being ravished. You know, it's not literal. No more than verse 20 and 21, and I mentioned in the first, all the bells on the horses would be marked holy to Jehovah. What does that mean, Holger? You're going to have bells on the horses? What does that mean? He's not talking in literal terms. No more than talking about being ravished. So also, he's just talking about a general picture of the church. The church would indeed have difficulties in warfare, but it's a parable of the church. For example, when we come down here to verses uh, 9 and 10, he says, The Lord will be king over the earth, and that day Jehovah will be one, his name one. Then he tells us, The land, the land would... Uh, flatten out on either side of the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem would rise up literally? Literally? No. No, it's not literally. He says, listen to carefully, all the land will be made like Arabah from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. And she, that's the city, would be lifted up. The city lifted up, the mountains lifting up Jerusalem. Literally? Now, don't come up here and say, well, the women ravished, that means literally. What about your wife? What? <laughs> my, my. The whole passage is figurative. The entire passage is figurative. He says you can't go to heaven. Well, if heaven is only what you have now, I'm really not so sure I want to go there. This is it right here. This is it. That's it. Now, this is not the reward. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, have, I, have, a, I have a good... Matter of fact, my cousin Todd here, who's, who's here, his son-in-law has been run over by a drunk driver several years ago, a couple years ago, so he's in a wheelchair. He's in a wheelchair. He can't do anything. He's a young man. So sad. And you know many sad cases like this. This, this is it. That's it. It's all there is to it. And you can lose it if you're unfaithful. You can lose heaven. Is that it? Well, that's hard to believe that people would believe that. He says, uh, let's, uh, let's go on. Well, let's look at chart number 51 to 52 for a moment. Chart number 51 to 52. That's kind of way down there. The media is just down there. Okay, look here at uh, this one. I wanted to make mention of this. He mentioned that regarding salvation. Salvation is used in more than one context. It's used in more than one sense, Brother Neubauer. He says, salvation does not change. That was his statement. Okay, let's look at it. All right. Save us, O Lord. Save from the wrath of God. There's coming eternal wrath. Save the people from their sins. Salvation is used in more than one sense. There is salvation from sins over on the right. There's physical salvation. Save us. Same kind of word, same word that is used. 
Or Peter said, Save us, O Lord. Except the days would be short, none would be saved. Matthew 24, 22. Does that word soteria in Greek, does that mean we have eternal salvation? None would be? No. He's talking about simply physical salvation. Every time you see the word saved, it doesn't mean necessarily the same thing as used. How do you, how do you make a determination as to how, how the word is to be understood? Local context. Local context. That's the key. It's got to be a local context. Let's go to the next chart on that one. This is the next one. Same thing regarding time. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. They were saved. as they, Weren't they baptized into Christ in Acts 2, 38? Being baptized into Christ. And they were, and the Lord added unto the church, such as were being saved. Were they saved? Yes, from sins. Does that mean the eternal salvation? No. There are some in the church that Paul talked about their spirit needed to be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That would be another salvation. They had already lost their salvation in the sense that they had sinned. Or, same thing in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, Romans chapter 5 and verse 10 is future. He shall be saved by his life. Jesus is able to save us to the uttermost. Paul speaks about those. He shall be saved so as through fire, 1 Corinthians 3 and 15. Salvation is used in different senses in the New Testament. All right, let's look at a couple of things here. Uh, let's, uh, let's, gl well, let's glance at Luke chapter 17 very quickly. Luke chapter 17. I believe this is a reference to the second coming of Christ. I don't believe that it's a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. The question is, the question is, it's not the event of the destruction of Jerusalem, but the question is, is it possible for our Lord to use language that is exactly the same or even similar in different contexts? Is that possible? Yes, it's possible. We see that. We've seen that from the Old Testament already. The same thing is the case here. This is not the destruction of Jerusalem, even though he uses language such as he used in the destruction of Jerusalem speech. For example, after the same manner shall it be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. But then he says in verse 33, Whosoever shall seek to gain his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I say unto you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, one is taken, the other is left. One night, one day, it's all night and day. That's not... It's not the same thing as the destruction of Jerusalem that is in Matthew chapter 24. The passage doesn't lend itself that way. It's only his assertion that so states. Now, I wanted to get a couple of things in here very quickly regarding uh, the Lord's Supper. And that's uh, number, chart number 17, 18, 19, and then 82. Now, brethren, this is a, this is a serious business, as everybody understands and knows to be the case. And uh, this regarding the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11 and 26, of course, we're to partake of the Lord's Supper. And we're to do it until he comes again. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. All right? Here's how it's put in one expositor's Greek testament. Until he comes again. Publish his death until he comes. The Lord suffers the great preacher of death until his second appearing. Robertson's word picture. Everybody understands that. Let's go to the next chart. So here's what, here's really the position of the realized eschatologist. And this is from Ed Stevens. Ed Stevens, I don't know him. But he made a comment that's pretty plain. Is it possible that our requirements of observing the Lord's Supper and many other things are unnecessary? Now why does he say that? Because he sees the word until. Until the Lord comes. Take the Lord's Supper until he comes. Well, what then? Well, now let's, we're going to find out what now. Let's go to the next chart. Here's uh, Brother Preston who's sitting here. He says, we have, let's look at the bottom paragraph. The supper had a new meaning during the transition period. It had not yet found perfection or consummation. So he says it could be taken in the predicted new way. That is at AD 70. AD 70, a new way at AD 70. That is the position that they take. Let's go to the very last chart, which is number 80, uh, 82, I believe it is. 82. And this, Brother Neubauer says exactly the same thing. Now here's what Brother Neubauer has to say on the subject. All right. Commenting on 1 Corinthians 15 and 25, we'll talk about that tomorrow night. This is the meaning of 1 Corinthians 11 and 26, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper was not ending at Jesus' return, but rather initiated the fulfillment of a relationship with the Father so that Jesus would partake of the Supper with us in a new way. Matthew 26 and 30, that he meant verse 29 here. I will take the Supper with you new in my kingdom. As the Father's kingdom would we be restored. He's referring to A.D. 70 when he says that. All right. Why is it then, if the, new, the supper was taken in a new way at 70, that's what it refers to, why is it that Paul quotes 1 Corinthians 11, or rather quotes Matthew 26, 
in 1 Corinthians 11, when he says regarding the Lord's Supper, you know that with the Lord in the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and having given thanks, and then he goes through the passage. Why does he quote the passage as to what's happening at Corinth from Matthew chapter 26 as applicable to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, when in point in fact, according to Brother Neubauer, it wasn't going to be fulfilled, it wasn't even going to be taken by our Lord in a new way until AD 70. So what's Paul? But did Paul misquote the passage? Did Paul misapply the passage? That's a better question. Did he misapply the passage? Paul quotes Matthew chapter 26 and verse 29, 26 to 29, in 1 Corinthians 11, as the Lord's Supper being partaken of by those at Corinth. And yet Brother Neubauer says, no, that doesn't apply until A.D. 70. At A.D. 70, that's when the new supper, the supper would be taken in a new meaning, right. and that's the passage he refers to. Okay, five more minutes, and then the last two speeches.
Quick scotch. Yeah. All right, good people, it's time to begin this last affirmative speech, and I would ask Bill to be more concerned with following my arguments than making affirmative arguments. Really, he's making a lot of affirmative arguments, and uh, I'm going to ask him to follow me, and I don't, I, he really shouldn't uh, be making so many arguments in the affirmative. He didn't really answer much of what I had to say. I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. Now, Isaiah is predicting the fall of Babylon historically took place 539. You see. Now, in Isaiah 13, he uses these figures, but in every time that there is a figure, there's enough of the event for them to grasp that it's about to take place and when it would take place. So in Isaiah chapter 13, we find the pangs and the sorrow. So please notice in verse 8 of Isaiah 13. And they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. There will be pain as a woman in childbirth. Now, you see here that he's speaking about national judgment. Look at Isaiah 13, please. And verse 17, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. So here's national judgment. Babylon was a world power, and their world is about to change. He is going to punish the world for its evil. Look at Isaiah 13, verse 11. I will punish the world for its evil. All right? Now please notice in verse 16, their children also will be dashed in pieces before their eyes, their houses will be plundered, and their women ravished. Now I contend that Zechariah was using judgment language. It's exactly the same. Bill has his AD 33 glasses on and pours everything into Pentecost and he says that Zechariah 14, when the women are ravished, it's figurative, figurative about the church. Why would a prophet use a wife ravished? Would you? Oh, because you've got some trouble. 
So women are going to be raped? Come on now, Bill. We are talking about judgment language. And in every prophecy, in every single prophecy, there are identifying <clears throat> factors, similarities that the prophets are using, pointing to a great event. Now, in this great day in Isaiah chapter 13, look at verse 10. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun is darkened. It's going forth. The moon will not cause its light to shine. That's judgment language. It means that your world has changed. When my dad left uh, uh, Germany after World War II, he discovered that Germany was wrong. So the uh, Russians had taken over East Germany. He told me he knew that he was wrong. He packed his bag. The Russians had taken his bank accounts, all his family's houses, occupied it, and left. And then he flew to the United States of America and borrowed money. And he said, Holger, he was talking to me about it. My world was upside down. It was the darkest day in German history. The people had lost their identity, and a nation had come in. And that's how the prophets used the language the heaven and the earth. And that is what he is saying. And Bill Lockwood is simply in desperation mode. He's in desperation mode because he says that Zechariah 14 is figurative about the church. There are two Jerusalems. One being destroyed, you're right. One being lifted up. One being lifted up. The new Jerusalem. Now give me Revelation 21 verse 3, please. Now pay attention, Bill. I want you to follow me and not make so many affirmative arguments. I'm going to try to follow you, I promise. So Revelation 21, 3, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he shall be his people, and God himself will be with them, and their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, Bill takes a position, I'm pretty sure, that these things are fulfilled, and if not, come up and tell us that they're not fulfilled. In Revelation chapter 22, in verse 6, these things would shortly come to pass. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10, the time is at hand. In Revelation 22 and verse 12, behold, I come quickly. Jesus was coming quickly to deliver this new reality. It's a spiritual book. It's a spiritual concept. He has the idea, oh, you know, he's talking about physical pain. From God's perspective, he's more concerned about the salvation of your soul than your physical condition. Now, what I would like here now is Isaiah 33, please. Isaiah 33. Please tell me when this prophecy is fulfilled, Bill. Please tell me. So now we find the inhabitant will not say, verse 24, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. Do you see how the prophets use the term sick? He's not talking about physical sickness. He's talking about the disease from sin, your death of sin. That's what he's talking about. And here he says your sickness would be done away when you're forgiven. So when does forgiveness of sins come? He says it was delivered on Pentecost, but he can't go to heaven. He can't go to heaven until the judgment. I suggest to you the judgment took place behind the scenes. Listen, we're not saying that the destruction of Jerusalem is the judgment. It's the sign of the judgment. It's the time when the kingdom of God is established over all the earth. In Daniel chapter 2, there are four world empires. Babylonian, right? Median Persian, Grecian, and Roman. They're dominating world empires. In those days of the fourth world empire, the kingdom of God would be established. Now follow me, Bill. The same land base, the same land base that the worldwide powers occupied were then occupied by the kingdom of God that necessitated world evangelism. When did world evangelism take place? It took place incrementally as the kingdom of God was growing. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is likened unto a mustard seed, like three measures of meal. So the gospel was going into Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. When would the kingdom be consummated, and when would heaven be opened? In Zechariah 14, 9, he says, In that day, one king, one Lord over all the earth. God is not going to judge the earth until the gospel becomes the instrument of God's judgment. And then salvation is obtained. Yes, it's spiritual. Are you telling me to be in Christ is not to make you filled with joy? 
Are you saying in Christ right now that if you're in Christ you can die? Because Jesus said if you live and believe in me you will never die. Now that sounds like pretty good news to me. And in fact it's a spiritual reality. So now I know I will never die. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that concept. You will never die. Of course you'll die biologically. And to tell you the truth, I don't give a hoot. God can take me right now. I don't give a hoot. Right now, one way or another. Now listen, I enjoy my life. I'm having a good time. I like Bill. I'm glad I'm debating him. But as far as my eternal life, when I understood that eternal life was granted, in a covenant of strength. And I would never die because heaven was open. I don't have to go into some ridiculous transition where my physical body is borrowed, is buried in the ground, and God's going to resurrect me one day so I can have my physical body redeemed and then go to heaven. That's balderdash, and that comes from original sin. If there's no original sin, there's no original death. The religious world believed in original sin. Alexander Campbell stood against original sin. That was a new idea. And we've been weaning ourselves off this late date of the book of Revelation all these years. Listen, you go to the commentaries, and I know what he has done. I used to teach at Tennessee Bible College. I've got a master's degree as well. I've been educated, and I know full well how we study. In Churches of Christ, I'll tell you how we study. We borrow our denominational commentators, like the pulpit commentary, or Barnes Notes, and we see what the guys believe throughout the years. I'll bet you have more denominational books in your library than you have from, from brethren. The truth of the matter, I know that the book of Revelation has reference to the fall of the temple. Now let me prove that to you. Revelation 1.1, shortly come to pass. Revelation chapter 1.3, the times of him. Revelation 22.6, shortly come to pass. Revelation 22 and verse 10, the time is at hand. I come quickly. Now, those are bookends. The original manuscripts had no paragraph markings. There's very little punctuation. The way that a Jewish author would put together a manuscript was by identifying the subject, ending with the subject, and everything is in between. It's the same subject. Now, Revelation 11, 8, let's go to the middle of the book. Let's go to the middle of the book. So now we find the dead bodies, the two witnesses, my opinion, Paul and Peter. They lie in the streets of this city, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? There's only one city that he was crucified. And that is in the city of Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was crucified. The judgment comes when that city is judged for taking innocent blood. Now... That's what the book of Revelation is about. And the Old Testament predicts, predicts that the prophetic office is going to end at the time that there is this restoration of Israel when God would tabernacle with men. That's Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3. The Old Testament predicts this great event in which Jerusalem is going to fall. And when that city, that fortified city falls, that's when heaven would be open. It's God's plan. Please ask yourself the question, why does God have to redeem your physical body? Do you have sin in your physical body? I ask, I'm in the affirmative bill. Do you have sin in your physical body? And please tell me why your physical body has to be redeemed and adopted. Romans chapter 8 is about old covenant Israel dying. The spirit, the miraculous operation of the spirit comes into it. It's bringing back to life. And soon the adoption process would be complete at the redemption of our body. He's not talking about your physical body. He's talking about the church. Now, to whom does the adoption belong? Romans 9, 4, it belongs to Israel. Go check your context, Bill. Romans 8, 10 to Romans 9, 4 refers to old covenant Israel. Now, when the temple fell, the temple fell, forgiveness of sins was obtained. Now give me Romans eleven twenty seven, 27, please. He is quoting Isaiah 59, 10, and 11, and Bill Lockwood doesn't know the voice of the prophet, so he gets all mixed up. Now notice, for this is my covenant with them, and I take away their sins. Are you aware that he is quoting from Isaiah chapter 27? Have you even read Isaiah chapter 27 before you call us heretics? He is referring to Isaiah chapter 27. Now give me Isaiah 27, verses 9 through 11. When I take away their sins. That's in their future. That was their future. That's what he says in Romans uh, 
11, 27. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of the taking away of his sin. When? When? Now notice, please, Bill, you, got to, you have to follow me. And I want Isaiah 27. I want you to exegete Isaiah 27. When he makes all the stones of the altar like chalk stones, are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense altars shall not stand. That's old covenant language. Those wooden images and those altars in the temple, they will not stand because God is going to bring them a different kind of plan of salvation. Now notice, please, in verse 10. The fortified city will be desolate. Go back to verse 9, please. Therefore, by this the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of the taking away of his sin. When he makes the stones of his altar like chalk stones. Now look at verse 10. Get the fortified city will be desolate. Please give me your wonderful exegesis now. And kind of vaunt over this. And explain why that's not the destruction of Jerusalem. Please tell me. That's when God rectified the blood of all of the, uh, those shed upon the, uh, the earth. You see, there are three great feasts that the Jews observed. Deuteronomy 16, 16, three times in the year, seven feast days, but revolved around the seven great feast days. There's the Passover. There's the Pentecost. And then there is the Feast of the Tabernacles and the Atonement. The Atonement is associated with tabernacles. Before the tabernacles, be the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Tabernacles of God. The Bible says that those feasts are, present tense verb, are a shadow of good things about to come. So they're still operating. The Passover was not for forgiveness. It was for the hiding of sins. It was for the hiding of sins. And so they're wandering for 40 years. And they're looking for an established tabernacle. And so God is taking them out of Egypt. He's bringing them through the wilderness. And he's going to give them a tabernacle and a temple. And David will one day be their king. God is going to perform that same type and antitype over again. The day of atonement takes place when the temple falls. It is the day when the high priest would come out of his tabernacle. That's Acts chapter 3, 19 through 21. To bless the people. And then, and then we find God then atoning, giving atonement for the people, and heaven is open. It is proleptical. You know, I've debated you twice, two, two times, two nights an hour apart. I'm asking you, please, you never answered this question. If your salvation is complete in Christ, forgiveness of sins, why can't you go to heaven today? Would you please explain the redemption of your physical body at the end of time? It was a process. It was a process. So they're in the kingdom, Colossians 1.13. They're receiving the kingdom, Hebrews 12.28, and yet the kingdom is coming. Luke 21.31, when you see these things come to pass, know the kingdom of God is not at hand. The Bible says that they were redeemed, Ephesians chapter 1. Give me Ephesians 1 real quick. How much time I got? Four, four minutes. Four, four minutes. Thank you. Give me Ephesians 1. And that's the only time that Jesus spoke about the kingdom with an event, and he denies the words of Jesus. He said, that's not the kingdom. It is the kingdom. And it fits with the Old Testament prediction, Zechariah 14, 9. That's the day when there would be one king over all the earth. Now, Ephesians 1, verse 7. You know, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So they have redemption, right? But notice something is happening, verses 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit. If it's perfect with the types of the manna ceasing when they meet the law. He says, I made this type up. Oh no, the law, the law having a shadow of good things to come. Why do you think that event is there? You're supposed to look for the types and the shadows in the Old Testament. Joshua 5 is the type. It fits us. It refutes you. Now please notice. Verse 14, who is the guarantee? You see this word guarantee? That's the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the purchased possession. You tell me what the purchased possession is. You're in the negative. You follow me. What is the purchased possession? He told these same Ephesians in Acts 20 and verse 32, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock of God, over the which is God make you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. There is one purchased possession. Don't let him tell you this nonsense that your physical body is the purchased possession. There is one. There's one body. And if you're 
salvation hope. It's outside of the one body. It's a false concept. So they are saved. They're being saved. Salvation's coming. They're in the kingdom. They're receiving the kingdom. The kingdom is coming. It's proleptical. It's an already but not yet. This is the guarantee. This is the down payment of the redemption of the purchased possession. It's the redemption of the body. They were waiting for the redemption of the body. The 40-year transition. That's what he's saying. And then heaven is open. That's pretty good news to me. That I don't have to go to a waiting period. With the old covenant the saints who got in there with the blood of goats and bulls. I have Christ. Full salvation. And if you don't think that's good news, I'm sorry. You ought to look at the world a bit more spiritually than you do. Now he said some things about the Lord's Supper. I got I'm in the affirmative. You follow me, Brother Bill. I love you. But follow me. Give me Romans 5.13. <clears throat> We've got to remind ourselves to love each other, right? Romans 5.13. For unto the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Do you ask me now? That's the same Greek word, 1 Corinthians 11.26. Until the law, sin was in the world. Now, was sin in the world after? The law? Yes or no? There's your answer. It manifested in a new way. Listen, when Jesus was returning, he was coming this way. Because heaven is open, it was no longer sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit. So they're yearning to partake with the Lord because they know that heaven is going to be open. Jesus said, I will not partake of this until that day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's not talking about Acts 2. He's talking about a new reality. He said, if I don't go away, I will not send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to you. And that's what he's speaking. When he, by the way, John 14, when he says, I will come to you, the promise is that the Holy Spirit, I'm going to go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's coming. He's not coming in Pentecost. There you go with your AD 33 glasses again, trying to pour everything in the day of Pentecost. You can't do it. It's a tabernacling of the people. A tabernacling of God with the people. So what does Revelation 21, 3 say? God's tabernacle is with men. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. It's simply the completion of what had begun. So heaven is open. But for Bill Lockwood, you can't go to heaven now. You need a physical resurrection at the end of time. Okay, we'll take five minutes. <clears throat> Let's be real strict on that. It's 20 after. We'll be back at uh, 25 after. Bill will have his last speech, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, where we'll take five questions.
have a, a final speech of the in the negative from Bill, and then immediately following that, we will not have a bathroom break. We're going to go ahead and get right into our question and answers, if that's okay with Bill and Holger, we'll get right immediately into that. We've decided to take six questions instead of five. So we want, uh, what we'd like is to get three, uh, three people with questions to Bill, and three people with questions to Holger, and uh, each man will have two minutes to rebut back and forth, and that'll follow immediately after Bill's negative. And Bill, whenever you're ready. Praise him, praise him, praise him. All right, thank you so much for your patience. I know that this is a long evening. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, uh, Brother Newbauer and I are friends, and we push each other, and that's, that's fine. And I appreciate him, and I know that he appreciates me. And I don't want anybody to draw a conclusion that we are enemies personally, and that's not the way I feel about anybody here. Um, so at any rate, it's, uh, I appreciate joining the issue in a very uh, fervent way. There are several things that we do need to talk about, however, very quickly before we begin. He pointed out, uh, he made the comment, rather, that the coming of Christ is not Pentecost. And uh, he made that in reference to something I had said in the last speech, uh, because I did point out one of the comings of Christ was Pentecost. Now, let's just, you listen to this statement, and you tell me what it is. This is John chapter 14 and verse 18. He says, I will not leave you desolate, I come to you. Then we come down to verse 26, but the Comforter, even the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I said to you. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Then verse 28, you heard how I said to you, I go away, I come to you. I come unto you. What's he referring to there? He's referring to the Holy Spirit and the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's referring to, I come unto you. That's the context. Isn't the local context, doesn't that dominate everything? Shouldn't that dominate our understanding of the Scripture? Certainly so. Certainly the Lord came with the coming of the Spirit, just as the Lord comes when people are converted into Christ, because he goes on to tell us in verse 23, uh, 22 and 23, uh, the same chapter, he tells us very plainly, uh, Judas Iscariot made the question, what has come to pass that you will manifest yourself to us, not to the world? Jesus answered, if a man love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. What does he mean? He's referring to a coming of the Lord, spiritually speaking, when a person is converted. Now, I wanted very quickly to notice several other things. He says, um, he says I don't follow him. Well, you know, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. He needs to quit talking about my belief then. He's talked and talked and talked and talked about my belief and what I believe about the body and the physical body and blah, 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 and uh, so forth. But that's interesting. I didn't bring anything up about that. So, you know what? I, I think I've touched everything that he's brought up, generally speaking, Zechariah 14 and so forth, Luke 17. As a matter of fact, uh, I do want to get to this. Um, he says, uh, uh, let, let me look at this one. I, I felt like maybe I need to say something regarding this. I felt like he mocked the idea of God resurrecting dead bodies. Why does God need to resurrect dead bodies? And why does God need to do that? Oh, I don't know. But the Bible teaches it. Now, why, why, is, why does the, God tell us, why does our Lord tell us that we need to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? I don't know. It's just that's what he tells us to do. I don't question it. It's not mine to question. I recognize that's what he tells us to do. But I don't get up here and say, well, why do you need that? Well, that's what he says. And that's all I can say regarding that issue. Uh, regarding original sin, he says, well, uh, now I pointed out in one of the speeches that uh, in all the churches, in all of history, no one ever heard of this doctrine of realized eschatology full realized eschatology until it was brought, and by the way, I never said Max King started it. I, it was brought into the, into the Methodist Church in 1900. Max King picked it up, and then he picked it up from C.H. Dodd, who also was a denominational preacher. By the way, he criticized it. I thought this was interesting. What books I might have in my library? The truth is this doctrine was introduced into the religious world by Methodist preachers. So chew on that one for just a little bit. Then he said, well, how about... Uh, do you believe in original sin? Because they all believed in original sin. What, what, my point was what? My point was, it was never heard of. This doctrine was never heard of. Yes, I understand the church fathers were wrong sometimes, but he's confessing, he's self-confessing, yes, it was never heard of, but so what? They also believed in original sin. So there you have it, never heard of. So you need to take stock in that, and you need to think about it before you buy into a doctrine that he's teaching. 
He says Isaiah 13 and 8 is a world power of Babylon. I believe that to be the case, and this language that that the case. I understand that to be the truth. I understand that. Does that mean that every time language like that is used, it has to refer to that? Is that what that means? What rule of interpretation have you brought forward to say that has to be the case? Because now he goes to Zechariah 14 and says, here we are in Zechariah 14, and look at this. Matter of fact, let's look at it. Zechariah 14, I think, is one of those passages that I, I just, uh, I was amazed that he would say what he does regarding it. Here we have, in verses 9 and 10, we have the city of Jerusalem being lifted up and all the land flattening around, being flattened around it. Now, is that literal? No, it's not literal. But when it comes to the women being around, she said, well, that's got to be, that's got to be literal. And he even brought up my wife on this one. Now, I think that's pretty shocking. He's taking that in a literal sense, but he don't want to take the rest of it literally. No, it's all figurative. It's all figurative uh, turmoil that the church will go through. And that's, by the way, it's not the destruction of Jerusalem. Look here at verses verses 2. Half of the city should go to captivity and the residue should not be cut off from the city. They'll not go. They'll not be cut off. That, was that happened at Jerusalem? No, it didn't happen at Jerusalem. It's all a figure of the church. As a matter of fact, we have in verse 9 the Lord's dominion over all of the earth. Uh, the reception of the heathen into the kingdom of God in verse 17. We have the, the bells. Remember I pointed out that they have been marked. They shall be holy unto the Lord. Literal? No, it's not literal. It's a statement a parable, a parabolic overview of the church. And that's all that's involved in Zechariah chapter 14. He says, Isaiah 33 and 24, the people uh, will dwell there in the sea. Well, let me look into this one. He said, he says, Bill, I've asked you to debate, are you going to heaven? Are you going to heaven? I believe exactly as he points out that he believes, but I think inconsistently on his part. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 and 23, I desire to depart and be with Christ for it is very far better. I understand that. I believe that's, I believe that's a reward. I believe that's the time of reward. I don't believe you can fall from grace, however, there. He thinks you can fall from grace. Did you ever hear him come back to that? By the way, I've asked that question, and he never came back to it. Never did. Never came back to it. He thinks you can be in heaven, and you're in heaven now, and when you go after you die to be with Christ, after you be with Christ, he says you can still fall. Well, what's the difference then? There's no reward. That's the point. That's the point. That's not a reward to say, well, the same thing we have here. Is that a reward? Have you already been rewarded for your, for your faithfulness? I asked him also the question, when did you enter into heaven? What Give us the date. He never said anything. I asked Don Preston the same question in one of our debates. He never answered that question either. When did you enter into heaven? Well, they never answer those questions, and I want to know when that will be or when it was. And I have some interesting things to think about if that be the case. And then regarding John chapter 14. He says, I go, and Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place, I will come again, receive you unto myself. Now, he says that has to be the second coming of Christ, which he says it's at AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem. It has to be that period. Well, what does that mean then? And I ask the question. That means he's going to have more spiritual communion with the Father. That is, when the Lord said that, I'm going to go have spiritual communion with the Father, and you can have it too. That means when our Lord said it, he didn't have spiritual communion with the Father. And he was going to go have it. And that means Holder has it now, according to his doctrine. He has that spiritual communion. He argued in the last, but the Lord himself didn't have it. Now that's amazing to me. I cannot understand how anyone would come to such a conclusion when they have that particular doctrine in front of them. Then he mentioned Romans chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 11, 27. You know, he's kind of using the scattergun method here. Just a shotgun. We'll just shoot it out and we'll see what sticks and see what kind of, what, what kind of, what pellets might, might land somewhere. Let's look at Romans chapter 9 through chapter 11 very quickly. He pointed out, let's just, uh, let's just start in uh, chapter, uh, chapter uh, 11. Let's just start in chapter 11. And this is verses 25 through 27. Here, Paul is simply discussing what, and giving us an explanation as to what has already occurred. The Jews are not waiting until 70 or a future period. He is quoting, and you wanted to know about Isaiah. Well, here it is, Brother Holger. Here's Isaiah 27 and verse 9. This is my covenant with him when I shall take away the sins. Why does he speak in the future tense? Because he's quoting a passage. Does that mean that the future tense is valid for the Jews at that day, that they could not be saved, they could not enjoy a remission of sins until 70? By the way, did you hear 70 in the passage anywhere? No, I didn't hear it either. No, you didn't, you didn't hear anything about that. Well, let's listen to what we have to say right here. Listen to what Paul has to say, verses 28 and following. As touching, now here's how Paul summarizes what he just said. Listen carefully. 
As touching the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. Speaking of, to the Gentiles of the Jews. But as touching election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are not repented of. For as you in time past were disobedient to God, but now have obtained mercy. All right, who's that? The Gentiles have obtained mercy through their or by their disobedience. Even so have these also Jews been now disobedient that by the mercy shown to you they may now also obtain mercy. Can the Jews, when Paul wrote, obtain mercy? Yes, he just said they could. They may now also obtain mercy. Verses 25 through 27, he's just going back over what he said. If you don't understand that, let's look at the illustration that he gives of the olive tree in verses 16 and following. If the first fruit is holy, so is the loan. If the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, who's he talking about? Jews. They're lost. They're lost. If some of the branches are broken off, and thou, Gentile, being a wild olive, was grafted in among them, and didst become partaker with them of the root of the fatness of the olive tree, glory not over the branches, for if thou glorious, it is not you that bear the root, but the root thee. Then will say, then branches were broken off. That is Jews. Talking about Jews. Gentiles are saying, Jews are lost. Branches were broken off that, that I might be grafted in. He says, well, by their... Now, who's he talking about? Jews. By their unbelief, they were broken off. Can't get plainer than that, can you? They're already broken. They're already gone. The Jews who are unbelievers in Christ are gone. By their unbelief, they were broken off. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, neither will he spare thee. Then he goes on to tell us a little bit more. Behold then the goodness and severity of God towards them that fell, Jews, severity, but towards thee, Gentiles, God's goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, Jews, they also, if they continue not in their unbelief, may be grafted back in. Are they lost? Yes. He tells us just as plainly as can be spoken here. Verses 25 to 27, don't overturn that at all. He's simply giving an explanation regarding it. So he tells us, I would not, brethren, have you ignorant of this mystery, lest to be wise in your own conceits that a hardening of heart has befallen Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That has already occurred. He tells us that in verse 12 of the same chapter. He says, if their fall, Jews, is the riches of the world and their loss, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? That's a hypothetical question, but they're already lost. They're already fallen. They're already gone. And now he says, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. He's not talking about a number of Gentiles, people that would come in. He's speaking about when the gospel blessings go to Gentiles, Jews may also come in. And that will probably be the case if he says they are jealous of what he has been preaching. And that's exactly how he applies it. So this has nothing to do with AD 70, which was not in the text anyway to begin with. All right, let's Acts chapter 3, verse 19. I thought this was interesting. He thinks this is AD 70. We don't have that at all. That's just an assertion of his. But here we have another passage right from chapter 3. Let's see what he has to say on chapter 3 and verse 26. Unto you first God, be, having raised up his servant, sent him to bless you. Now he was making the point a moment ago that Christ had to come out of the tabernacle at 70 in order to bless the people. And he went to the book of Hebrews. By the way, the book of Hebrews doesn't say that anywhere. It doesn't say that. But here's where he, the Christ comes. What does it say in Hebrews or Acts chapter 3, verse 26? You want to know when he comes back? He comes to bless the Gentiles. Unto you, first God, having raised up the servant Jesus, sent, past tense, him to bless you. Who? Jews. Sent him to bless you in what? This is verse 26. In turning every one of you away from your iniquities. Christ has already come back, spiritually speaking, to the Jews in order to convert them to Christ. And that's the idea. So he asked, why can I not go to heaven? I believe I can go to heaven. I believe that. I don't believe, however, that's the final reward. I believe Philippians 1, 21 through 23 applies to me. However, I also believe the data of the scripture, which has such passages as 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. I'm already being offered. The time of my departure has come. I have finished the course. I fought the good fight. I fought the good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me, what? The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me. When? At that day. And not to me only, but also to all them that have loved what? His appearing, his coming. There's a reward that is later. And that's exactly what I believe regarding the subject. How about Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13? He says, this purchased possession is the church. I believe that's the church. I believe Ephesians 1, 13 is a reference to the church. But notice this, it's already purchased. 
And unto the redemption simply refers to, once again, the heavenly reward. Redemption is used in more than one sense in the passage. You don't believe that? Look at it, for example, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33. The women received their dead by a resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their what? Their deliverance, but that's the word redemption. Physical, he's talking about physical right there. That's the same word in the Greek language. They put deliverance there because it's obviously referring to physical persecution that they are now enjoying, or that they rather they would went through the persecution and they hoped that they would have a better resurrection later. But that's the word that is used in Hebrews 11.33. The word redemption doesn't mean necessarily always by his blood. But as a matter of fact, right here in Ephesians 1.7, the word redemption is used regarding the, the blood of Christ. And what does it say? In whom we have... That's past tense. Already. We already have our redemption through his blood. That's already stated right there in Ephesians 1. Then he uses unto the redemption later. That's referring, of course, to the same thing that Romans 8 is referring to. So let's turn to Romans 8 for just a moment. This is interesting, too. I thought, here we have a passage that is so telling against his position. Let's look here. Number one, he tells us that these are children of God. He says that in verse uh, 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. They're already children of God. But uh, as you receive not the spirit of bondage again under fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. All right? So now it goes on to say, verse 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed to us. Now he says that's 70. All right? Let's, let's think about it for a moment. Let's say that's A.D. 70. And that period of time at that particular juncture of history. Is that what Paul is referring to? The glories of that, pre that time, the glories are not worthy to be com compared. Or that is the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed to us. Do you know what? He couldn't even say when I asked him when he entered into heaven, when he got there. And yet here Paul says the glories that shall be revealed are not even to be compared. They're so great. They're so great. And yet he says, well, that came at 70. He thinks he's already in there, but he doesn't know when he got there. So here's the point. So you might be in a Muslim country, and they might capture you, and they will put chains on you, and they will, and they will, put, a, uh, they will put a sword on your neck. But you know what? It feels so much better because we're already there. We're already in heaven, and it's already, we're already enjoying the glories that shall be revealed. We're already enjoying it. And so we don't have anything more to look forward to. That's it. Paul says the sufferings of this present time. Isn't that interesting? Paul was suffering, and we might suffer like him. I don't know. I hope not. But we may suffer like Paul. Well, if we do, if we do suffer, it feels so much better because you're already there. You're already in there. It's hard to believe that they would take such a passage as this and say that it refers to AD 70 and we're already in there. All right, let's look at, um, let's look at Romans chapter 5. How much time am I working on here? Three minutes. Okay. You know what? Let me, let me instead do that. Let me just uh, let me go to the charts real quickly. Notice a couple of things. This is, uh, this is a chart uh, regarding the future is now in Hebrews. You know, the book of Hebrews speaks about that which is the world to come. But he's speaking about that which is present. For example, not to angels that he subject the world to come. But according to chapter 1, verse 13, he's already subjected. 1 and 3 and 2 and 8. He's already subjected the world to come. It's world to come in the sense of an Old Testament viewpoint looking at the New Testament. He's already subjected it. That he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. But what does chapter 8 verse 1 says? Listen to this carefully. We have such a high priest. And the things that we are saying, we have such a high priest. Who sat down at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. Who needs not daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins. And then for the sins of the people. For this he did once for all. When he offered up himself. Then also he tells us we're already entered into it. Notice the wording about Hebrews chapter 8, matter of fact, in verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. Such a powerful passage. And he wants to say that it all happened at 70. That we entered into the holy place or the Christ began ministering as a high priest. That's not true. Here he says, but now has he obtained a, when? Now. Now. He's already obtained and ministry the more excellent. By so much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted. Already done. It's already done. The new covenant's already there. The old covenant's already has been. How do you know that? Look at the next verse, Holger. For if the first covenant had been 
faultless, then we're no place to be sought for the second. It's already has been covered. So the future is now in Hebrews. So we have the same thing. Taste of the good powers, uh, taste of the uh, powers of the age to come. That's exactly what they're already enjoying. They're already enjoying the age to come powers. Or 8 and 13, that which is becoming all the ranks of ages. That's a reference from Jeremiah's prophecy, from the Old Testament viewpoint, which is a figure from the time present. Same thing. Here's another one, Hebrews 9 and verse 11. But Christ, Christ having come, a high priest of the good things to come. Is he, is he a high priest already when Hebrews was written? Yes. Christ having come, a high priest of the good things to come. Not the very image of the things. Can never with the same sacrifices. Anyway, let's look at, um, let's look, we have one more chart. We have seen four. Let's look at, uh, oh, that was, okay. Well, no, that's not it. 30 seconds. Okay, well, I'm down to 30 seconds anyway. All right, I want you to notice this also regarding the Lord's Supper. I'm wondering, wondering why he didn't mention the Lord's Supper at all. It is the question that I have regarding if indeed he is, his doctrine is right. Why do they participate in the Lord's Supper? By the way, I never believe, I don't believe in the rapture. I don't believe in that at all. I don't know why he kept saying that. I don't believe in the rapture at all. Uh, furthermore, he says I put everything in AD 33. No, I don't. No, I don't. But I do put the remission of sins was already there in AD 33 at the cross. Yeah, he's having a um, <clears throat> so. Give me two minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 You've been resting. Yeah. <laughs> we said immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing I'm having a I did say it. You know what? I, um, I that this statement's qualified. You can keep that one. I'll hand this one to hold. You can keep that one. I'll hand this one to hold. I think that will at least both work uh, while they're both on, don't they both? You know what? <sighs> well, uh, are we going to sit down? Or are we gonna... That's up to you two. If you want to put chairs up, it's good. I can leave that long. I'd say, I'd say just both of them stand up there. Well, let me take a minute. While, Hoger, while Hoger's in the restroom, can you... <laughs> no, I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to preach, brothers. As bad as I want to. Everybody who knows me knows I want to go. But uh, let, let me just say this. Um, Tomorrow morning, Kyle Elliott is going to have a discussion with Michael Miano on original sin. It's been brought up several times tonight. So Kyle Elliott is here. He's going to be talking with Michael Miano, who holds to the idea of original sin being uh, uh, relevant today. Okay, So that's going to happen from 10 to 12. Then from 1 to 4, we have three speakers tomorrow. Uh, memory serves around. I think we have Brent and... Uh, is Scott, I think, is on tomorrow, no? Saturday. We got three speakers tomorrow, maybe William. Go to four, and then we're gonna take a break and come back for another debate. So I just wanted to give that little plug. Come on in, hear what these guys have to say, because far more explanation and far more, you know, um, talk is gonna be coming about this topic. So, all right, let's get into our question and answers. I know how this is gonna go, and please forgive me. I'm not gonna be selective. I'm just gonna try to take. Uh, since he ended, did you not have them write them down? No, I didn't have them didn't have write them down. Okay. You yeah. yeah. okay. and, and, and I should have because here's what happens. Holger asked that because every time somebody wants to ask a question, they start explaining it and it takes no. five minutes to go yeah. through it, but no one even get to it. Listen, so, listen, none of that. No commentary. Right. Just All ask right. a question. None. <clears throat> ask a question concisely. Get to the Very point, good. we will deal with it, okay? So since Bill gave the last speech, we'll have the first uh, question. We're gonna have three questions for each man. 
If you have a question for Holger, raise your hand. We have two minutes to respond, so somebody keep up time, okay? All right, uh, thank you. Go uh, ahead. Okay. In uh, one of your speeches in uh, reference who, who to- Who are talking to me? Yes, yeah. Holger. Thank you. you. Yeah, this is what I said. <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't paying attention. He never does. He never listens to me. <laughs> okay. Over. Uh, in Joshua 5, verse 1, when you were talking about Joshua 5, and verse 1, you were yes. talking about how Christ appeared to Joshua. And, uh, At the end of verse 12, 13, I think. Okay. okay. You said that was a Christophany? Yeah, that's there? correct. Okay, and you said something about uh, 40 years rolled away, uh, sins rolled away or something. Can you explain that? I, I've never heard that before, and so I'd just like a better explanation sure. of that. Thank you. Um, what did you say? What, what, what did you say? Just give that to me. Right, that's the moderator, Mike. That, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Go ahead. They want to train with Bill at every Why time? you got to always give me trouble? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm done. Is this on? It is on. You can slow it in your hand like you like to do. Okay, so um, probably you haven't heard of that because our brethren have not studied the Old Testament as they should have. I don't mean to be arrogant about this, but here in the Old Testament it's contained with all the types and the shadows. What Joshua is doing is the same thing that Jesus will do. There will be a second exodus. The Bible says in Ezekiel 20 and verse 35, I will send you in the wilderness of the people, and I will meet you face to face. First Corinthians 13 and 12, the face to face meeting with Jesus, that's a spiritual revel, uh, revelation, revelation. And at that particular time, you rolled away their sins. So they're wandering for 40 years. That pictures the church from AD 30 to AD 70. As they were going through the transition from the old to the new, they're being changed from one glory to the other glory, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. So 40 years later, he rolls away the reproach. That's exactly what Jesus does, and uh, that's when the forgiveness of sins is obtained. So he meets Jesus at the 40-year transition. We believe Jesus reveals himself in Luke 17, 30 and 31. At that day, when someone is on the house top and is stuck in the house, not to come to town, to, to come down to take it away. That's the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. That's our position. So that's when the sins are rolled away. There's a proleptical approach to this in the New Testament. He says, well, they were a high priest. The high priest had to marry a virgin bride. When did the marriage take place? The marriage took place when Jerusalem fell. Uh, if that's not the case, then the Lord is a guilty of spiritual pedophilia because he would have had sex with an infant bride. No, 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 it's betrothal. They were betrothed, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. He accused me of uh, spiritual uh, um, adultery in the first uh, debate. What we have here is simply the betrothal period and the marriage, Revelation 19, 7, takes place when, when Jerusalem fell. The Bible says that. So it's the transition period. It's the Jewish betrothal, the 40-year transition. Thank you. There you go, Bill. Let's make it easy. Okay. You didn't use that? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Oh, yeah, that's okay. That's all right. Okay. I get my voice here tonight. <clears throat> I'm already going to get hoarse. Uh, well, first of all, I would say this. You know what? That's, that's an interesting theory, but that's all it is, is a theory. There is no New Testament passage, none, that so states. There is no passage by insp inspired preachers that takes Joshua chapter 5 and says that to be the case. That's simply a theory that he has. And that's all that it is. We don't have one passage. Furthermore, he says that the marriage took place in Revelation. And that would be at 87. I believe that Revelation has been fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. I believe that. I believe Don um, Preston and I talked about that in our debates. And I believe that to be the case. However, I want you to notice <clears throat> that this is only language that is speaking about victory. It's not about the marriage of the church in the sense that the church has not been married to Christ. If that be the case, then Romans chapter 7, verses 2 through 6 applies. The woman that has a husband is bound by the law to the husband as long as the husband lives. But if the husband dies, she is discharged from the law of the husband. So then if while the husband lives, she shall be joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she is no adulteress, so she shall be joined to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you are made dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you should be joined to another even to him who is raised from the dead. 
Christianity, or Christians are married to Christ. And the only way that could take place was when the law died. Revelation is simply a picture of victory. As a matter of fact, the word that is used in Revelation chapter 20, uh, 21, it says a, a bride adorned for her husband. The word is actually wife. And what's taking place here, that's, there's, two, there's two words. Don Preston probably knows this. There's two words. And one of them is nuve, which is bride. And that's not the word that is used here. Here is the word is wife, gune, wife, woman. The wife. And what is taking place here is, at Revelation, that is the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's simply a picture of victory. But to say that the church was not married to Christ is pointed out. I simply point out. Romans chapter 7, verses 2 through 6. Okay, question for Bill Lockwood. Uh, Don. <laughs> the Thomas person jumped right off, man. <laughs> okay. All right, hey, man. Go ahead. All right, Don. How are you? By the way, it's great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. It's been about 30 years. Huh? It, it's been a long time. Don't, don't mention 30 years, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Use this because we're trying to report it. Okay. okay. Uh, Bill, I understood you to, to say in regard to Hebrews chapter 9 that it does not say or teach. Uh, that the atonement would not be completed until uh, the blessing is given until the coming of Christ out of the most holy places. Did I understand that's that? Correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 22, in speaking of the offering of sacrifices in the tabernacle, including in the most holy place, which would be on Kippur, it says he came out to bless the people. No, no blessings until he came out. Could you please explain yeah. that? I'm happy, I'm happy to ask that question. Oh, let me have my mic, yeah. yeah. And, okay. You know what, that's true. I, <clears throat> I understand the Levitical context and background. However, that is not ever brought forward in the book of Hebrews. Number two, matter of fact, he doesn't mention that. doesn't mention that at all. As a matter of fact, he even tells us plainly in chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, inasmuch as this is appointed unto men once to die, and after this comes the judgment, even so Christ, having not once offered, bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time, now what? Apart from sins, to them that wait for him unto salvation. Nothing to do with remission of sins. As a matter of fact, he even tells us in chapter 10, verse 19, we should enter in, let us therefore enter into the holy place. Why, why can we do that? Because he's already opened it up. We can already enter in. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, isn't that right? Let us enter in to the holy place. And that's how he tells it in chapter 10, verse 19. Here's something else. Chapter 13 and verse 10 says, we have an altar. Therefore, they have no right to eat that serve the tabernacle. There are those who serve the tabernacle, Jews, but they have no right to eat the altar at the altar of Christianity, so to speak. That's a figure of speech, by the way, Holder. It's not literal. So nevertheless, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10, shows us the same thing. Then we also have, we already, chapter 13, verse 20, we already are remitted from sins by the blood of an eternal covenant. Furthermore, we have a new covenant that has already been given, according to chapter 8, verses 1 and following. We have such a high priest. Is Christ a high priest today? Yes, he's a high priest. Was he a high priest when Hebrews was written? Yes. He says in the things, now listen to this, in the things which we are saying, the chief point is this, we have such a high priest. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. Why? Because his work was accomplished. Now, I understand what Leviticus teaches, but it has nothing to do with, well, we need to put that on the book of Hebrews and say, okay, he's got to come out to bless the people. By the way, Acts chapter 3, verse 26 shows us that he's already come to bless the people, doesn't it? Unto you first God, having raised up a servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and try to away every one of you with your iniquities. Uh, question. Yes, so, where Bill, and from my perspective, gets way off track because he doesn't understand the already but the not yet all right so they're redeemed yet redemption was coming he says a different nature they're saved salvation was coming he says different nature the kingdom was there the kingdom is coming he says a different nature they have come to the new jerusalem hebrews chapter 12 and yet the new jerusalem is coming he thinks of a different nature no it's the same nature now the high priest had a work to do the high priest had to marry a virgin bride. So we find in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, I have betrothed you a chaste virgin. Do virgins have children? 
Do virgins have children? Do they have a conjugal relationship yet? No, because the Holy Spirit is miraculously conceiving children, just like Mary was not an adulteress. Mary had conceived in the Holy Spirit, and that's no adultery. Can it say that she's an adulterer? I don't think so. That's the picture of the church. The Holy Spirit is working for 40 years until such time that the marriage takes place. He says that Romans 7 is the marriage. The word marriage is not in the text. You show me the meal in Romans chapter 7. You will never find it. And as far as being dead to the law, they were dead to sin. Now, had sin died? Just, just look at the context. Take the chapter verse distinctions away, which were given by Stephen Langdon, the Bishop of Canterbury in 1227. Just take those chapter verse distinctions away, Robert Stevens, 1555, and read the entire context. Now watch it now, please, Paul. They were dead to sin. Had sin died? Or is it the fact that sin could not convict them? They're dead to the law. The law could no longer convict them, but the law hadn't died. The law hadn't died because the apostle Paul partakes with animal partakes of animal sacrifices in Acts 21, and he does so with impunity. He does so with impunity. That demonstrates the law hasn't died. They were dead to sin, and they were dead to the law in exactly the same way. Question for Holger. For Holger, Dan Derry? Yeah. Dan, for a minute, you got five of them. Just the only one I know of. <laughs> so, Bill, this is based on a chart you had. Yes, sir. Um, where you, you showed the multiple comings of the Lord in this Matthew 16. This question for Holger. Oh, this is for Holger? Yes, this one's for Holger. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, no problem. What, what, I'll, I'll get you next. Okay. Okay. I know that. I got everybody racing. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, one for Holger. All right, one for Holger. Uh, anybody? Got one for YouTube if you want to ask it. Brock has Brock. one. Brock got one? Brock, he's playing out of touch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just. Speak a little mic. Respond. I think, I think it's okay to ask my father this question, but. That if if we have free will in the afterlife, yeah, um, that would also mean that angels would have free will as well, because yes. in the sense that they can fall. Could yes. you maybe explain that a little bit better? Yes. So in fact, uh, in the spiritual realm, there was free will. My right? angels fell. No, but not all. Right? And so, if it's the case that we will have love in heaven. All right, on the other side. Now, I believe that we're in the heavenlies. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, they were lifted up in the heavenlies. That was the beginning of the heavenly age. And I believe full salvation is then delivered when Jesus returned and forgiveness of sins was granted and heaven was open. And that makes perfect sense. That's following Isaiah chapter 27. So now, as heaven is open, I have the concept that I will never die if I believe and live in him. Now, ask yourself the question. Will you quit to believe in Jesus on the other side? Probably not. Will you continue to say, no, I don't want anything for part of this. You know, I'm not going to live in him. Now, it's true. Some angelic beings who had free will fell. I think that's probably the rare exception. I think the principle is like this. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, train up a child when he's old and when, he, or when he's young, when he's old, he shall not depart from it. I've got an idea that no one's going to choose that. But the question is, do you want a situation without free will? You ever want a wife to love you without a free will? You just want a robot? Some men might, but <laughs> that's not the way it works. We want free will, okay? We want love, and we want someone who loves us for us, right? And share. Well, that's the way that it is. It's the same kind of a thing. And when you know you start talking about yonder, you start talking about yonder, the Bible says his ways are past finding out. I know this, that Jesus promised this. He who lives and believes in me shall never die. And I believe that that last death was overcome, that old covenant of world was overcome, 1 Corinthians 15. That's the death that was overcome. That's the last enemy. It was abolished. I'm going on this subject. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Bob, for that question. You know, <clears throat> As I pointed out during the, during the course of tonight, if that is what Brother Neubauer says is true, then there's sin in heaven too. It has to be. If you can fall from grace, then there's sin in heaven. If there's sin in heaven, how does that, how does that come about? Can anybody explain that? He didn't explain that. 
And furthermore, how is it a reward? What's the reward in it if it's just the same as it is here? Now, he said, he that believes in me shall never die. Well, I believe that passage. That applies to today as well. So there's no difference over there. The point is, there's no difference once you step into the eternal life with his doctrine. He has to say that. He has to say that because of 2 Timothy chapter 4, for me, uh, among many passages, where Paul says, Henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me at that day, and not to me only, but also to the, all them have loved his appearing, of his coming, the word is coming. Well, there's a crown of righteousness, which is later. We know that to be the case. But he says, well, I've got the crown of righteousness now. He has to say that because he's already squished every coming of the Lord into AD 70, so he's got to say it. But that means he's got sin in heaven. And he just can't get out of that one. Okay. I know who I'm going to. Stand right there, brother. Oh, yeah. And Dan Derry's got a question for you. Yes, sir. Cheerio. All right. So, again, yes, sir. back to your chart with, with the multiple comings. Yes, sir. You would mention in Matthew 16, 27, the 28th was Pentecost. That's correct. Okay. So my question is, since John in Revelation 22, 12 quotes... Matthew 16, 27 verbatim and applies it to the second coming after the millennium. How come you don't use John's interpretation of Matthew 16, 27 to the second coming and apply it to Pentecost? Where does he quote Matthew 16, 27 verbatim? In Revelation 22, 12. Let me look at the passage real quickly. <clears throat> I believe he quotes Matthew 16, 27. with me to render unto every man as his work is. You know what? That is true that there's going to be a reward given to those who are faithful in persecution. But that doesn't mean necessarily that that's the final reward at AD 70. For example, in Romans chapter 2 we have the same wording again. What is stated in Romans chapter 2? Have you noticed that passage? Same wording, same things. Look at the, how he words it here. This is, a, we'll begin Romans 2 and this is beginning in verse 4. <clears throat> despise us down the riches of his goodness forbearance and long suffering not knowing the goodness of God leads thee to repentance but after that hardness and impenitent heart treasure up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render unto every man according to his works to them that by patience and well doing what? you have to be patient and well doing seek for glory and honor and incorruption eternal life by the way you know the Baptists believe you have eternal life in full in full possession now what does that lead them to say? You can't fall from grace. You can't fall from grace. That's where you're going to have to go with all this. So then he says, To them that by patience and well doing should be glory and honor and incorruption and eternal life. But to them that are factious and obey not the truth, but obey unrighteousness, shall be wrath and indignation, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that works evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We have both Jews and Greeks all judged. Jews and Greeks. That's different than Revelation, isn't it? Yes, because Revelation is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, isn't it? No. Well, I, I believe it is. I believe it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. So that's talking about Jews. But here it's talking about Jews and Gentiles uses the same language again. The point is you can't say, well, the same language is used there, therefore it's got to be the same event. You can't do that on any passage in the Bible. As a matter of fact, there are many passages in the Old Testament that use language that is used frequently in different contexts, such as Romans 1, 16, quotes of Acts 2 and 4, to say something different than Paul used it to say in Hebrews chapter 10. He used it to say something completely different in two different passages, and yet he quotes the same passage of Acts 2 and 4. Uh, interesting, he brings up Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2, 3. Yet yeah, there's a little while. Now there's the type and the antitype, all right? So in Habakkuk writes in 610 B.C. At 606 B.C., the royal sea line is taken off into captivity. The Hebrew writer says, yet yeah, in a very, very little while, literally. He's using it the same way the prophets. Here's the type. Here's the antitype. Jesus was coming in a very, very little while. Now, if the Hebrew writer is using the term just as Habakkuk did, that means he was coming in about three years. Guess what? Hebrews is written in about 68 AD. It fits perfectly with what we we're saying in full salvation would be granted. Now, he says in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12, 
that somehow this is kind of a different reward, a different reward. He is quoted from Isaiah 62 and verse 11. That's exactly what he's quoting. And our, our brother was quoting from Matthew chapter 16, 27, and 28 because he's talking about the same thing. He's making a 40-year prediction. He says, some of you will not taste of death. Some of you will not taste of death. Now, Bill Lockwood thinks that Judas Iscariot is going to die. That's his doctrine before the kingdom is going, going to come. No. Jesus is using the phrase some in comparison to the many. That is, most of you will die, some of you will not. He's making a 40-year prediction. He's talking about AD 70. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, the greater part remain, some have fallen asleep. The concept there is the some are in the minority, the greater part. Jesus says, some of you shall not taste of death. Some of you shall not taste of death. He's not talking about what's going to take place in six days. He's talking about what's going to take place over 40 years. And so in John chapter 21, he tells Peter, if John tarries till I come, what is that to you? He's going to tarry my position. Peter is not. Peter said that his end was at hand in 2 Peter chapter 1. And the same language is used in 2 Peter chapter 3. So what we have is Isaiah 62, 11. I, okay. I can go on with this one. Five. Anyone have a question for the Hogue? Uh, you've had two. Does any, I, I, I want to be fair. Does anyone else have one for Holger? All right. Is this my third one? This will be your third one, and then he's got one, and then we're done. Okay. Uh, Brent has one. California, California connection. Now, don't worry a little bit. This is his fourth, isn't it? Are we doing five? Is it five? No, three each. Three okay. each. Okay. Yeah, so this is his yeah, third. Yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. Okay. That's okay. Now, let me get back to This is to me? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> you want to go ahead with the last one? Then you went to rebuttal. Now you have a no Okay. I think I just heard Bill, this is to Holger, but I think I just heard Bill refer to Hebrews 10, 19, as we enter into the holiest. And if the holiest is entered into by the blood of Christ, it's a new and living way in verse 20. And then in verse 22, let us draw near. Then are we not already in Christ in the heavens? Yes, as a matter of fact, where I'm going to disagree with Bill is that he is not understanding the already, but the not yet, but simply the progression of the same thing. So let's watch now. In Hebrews 9, 28, he's going to appear a second time without sin unto salvation. All right? So he's going to complete that which began. He's not going to suffer again. He suffered once. He doesn't have to suffer again. He's going to take care of sin that's reigning while the old covenant world is reigning. Now he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, the law having, present tense word, ver, uh, verb, the law having a shadow of good things literally about to come. And what is he going to do? He's going to take away the first. He might establish the second. Hebrews 10 and verses 9 and 10. And in Hebrews 10, 37, he's coming in a very, very little while. Now, Bill's going to weave in and out of covenants here. He's got more coming to the post office. And the truth of the matter is, is that there is one final and second coming. And it was right around the corner. Once there is a time indicator in a text, every other time that event is mentioned, it is Guided by the same time indicator. They're not variety of comings. He's making that up in his own mind. That's like saying in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, when they had the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we don't know it's the first day of the week. Yes, we do. Acts 20 and verse 7 is the time indicator. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 11 is the first day of the week. It's a synecdoche from 1 Corinthians 16. When the Bible says the coming of the Lord is at hand, every other time the coming is mentioned, it's by the same time indicator. It was near. <clears throat> Very interesting. <laughs> you know, but what I thought was interesting, he didn't like the many coming. Brother Neubauer, in the Old Testament, were there various comings of the Lord? Yeah, you bet there were. There are a lot of comings. There are many comings of the Lord. It depends upon to whom was being written, to whom was being to who, the, who the audience was, who was doing the writing, and to what what people they were talking to. It just depends upon it. There were many comings of the Lord in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, if you take your interpretive principle that all of them must be one, then you have eliminated Christ's coming in the New Covenant. Because some of the comings in the Old Testament were literal comings of Jesus Christ. 
So what interpretive principle have you announced tonight by which you can make a determination? None, none at all. No, everything has to be interpreted with one coming, spiritual coming. He's wrong on that. Here's an interesting one too. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he mentioned that's a, that's a great passage, but that's my passage, not his. It says, he takes away the first that he might establish the second. He's talking about the covenants and what has already been done. Saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices are said, thou wouldst not neither have pleasure therein, the which are offered according to the law. Then as he said, I am come to do thy will. What? He takes away the first that he might establish the second. Now listen to this. By which will we have been sanctified. That past tense? You bet it is. Which will was it? The second. He takes away the first that he might establish the second. By which will we have been sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Does that sound like past tense? It is past tense. It's already done. And he's not waiting for the covenant to come later. So he's wrong on both of those accounts. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. He's just, you know, he missed it on the law having to shout of the good things to come. The good things to come have already come. They've already come in Christ. We've shown that. From the chart I've had, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. We have it in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 5. We have it in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Christ having come, a high priest of the good things to come. Is he already a high priest? Yes, of good things to come. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill Lockwood. Thank you. Uh, forgive uh, me, brother. I kept forgetting. Is he Kyle? Kyle Bigger. Kyle Bigger. All right. Yeah, that, I'll, I'll try not to forget that again. Uh, you guys have been absolutely fantastic. Appreciate your deal. Appreciate your Bible knowledge. Appreciate what you're bringing. Um, don't agree with it, but it's good, healthy discussion. And we appreciate all of y'all who are attending. Tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., Michael and Kyle. Then 12 noon, we'll start off with three uh, speakers. And then again at 6 p.m. tomorrow, Bill and Todd, we'll see you guys tomorrow. We appreciate right. it. Thank you, man. Thank appreciate you, guys. So yeah. Thank you so much. Bill. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Everyone have a good night, yeah. and we'll close it down. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your hospitality here. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for your understanding. All right, I'm going to go to the welcome.